84, saddled by Martin Pipe. He's a popular each-way chance. Well, hello and welcome to Cheltenham on Gold Cup Day. What a wonderful week it's been so far. And the weather has held up pretty well today. It's bright and blustery, I think you'd call it. Uh, very blustery, in fact. There's a very strong wind exercising those flags to the full. But there's no rain forecast until later in the day. So with any luck, we're set fair. And today, we're racing on the new course. The official going is good, good to soft in places. And as you can see, the course in really wonderful condition. And this is the scene on Gold Cup Day. Yesterday, over 36,000 people were here. Today, the crowd could be in excess of 50,000. This is the view you'd see if you were one of those hardy people who go parasailing from the top of Cleve Hill. And it's been really busy and active since early this morning. A lot of the Irish didn't go to bed last night, stayed up all night, and were out on the course early this morning to savour the flavour of Go Cup Day. And as well as the Go Cup, there's a mega jackpot today. £298,000 carried over from yesterday. Today's pool should be in excess of half a million pounds. And it's St. Patrick's Day, and there's a real Cayley feeling to the day. For only the fifth time it coincides with Go Cup Day. There's plenty of shamrock about and plenty of Irish money too after the first and last races yesterday. All of which leads me inevitably to Henry Kelly. And indeed it is St. Patrick's Day. And of course, when you think of St. Patrick, you think of the spread of Christianity. No, you don't. You think of Cheltenham. And you think of Arkell, who won one of his gold cups on St. Patrick's Day. There's Arkell striding up to the line, the runaway winner of his third successive gold cup. But of course, with no disrespect to the great Arkell, we also have to think when it's the Irish connection of the great dawn run. As they race to the line, and the mares begin to get up, and as they come to the line, she's made it! Dawn run has won it! And of course, you also think of a pint of the black stuff. And with me, Father Sean Breen, a Roman Catholic priest from Ireland. But Father Breen, I don't see your Roman collar on today. Well, I don't see the doctor with his telescope, do you? <laughs> doctor without his telescope. Or the, now, med, or the nurse in white. The nurse is in white. Uh, Father Breen, your voice is gone. From cheering home the Noli yesterday, Henry, I lost right. my voice. When I saw that horse going up the hill, I lost my voice. Great triumph for Ireland yesterday. Marvelous, marvelous. Now, it's been Patrick's Day, uh, Father Breen. Um, you're over here, and I understand that already this morning you've celebrated Mass uh, for the Irish punters to wish today's horses luck. But sure, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be Patrick's Day without having the Mass, Henry. She, you know that yourself. <laughs> what about the horses in you, Nile? Have you still got a horse? Um, I have a horse running today in Leopardstown. Yeah. Uh, I hope I hope it goes well. I don't know the result yet. Fingers um, crossed. Fingers crossed. But. Uh, which, which uh, as a project manager called, called Life Project. Nice. He's going well. I sold my good one, like a fool most people yes. said. Cushion a tenner, you got tenor, it. Yes. Close to the fire. Close to the heart of the fire. Close to the heart of the fire. Exactly. Right. And um, I have a little bit some pieces of other ones which will right. come out later in the year. Can you give us anything for today? Well, I think that Charlie Hoy's horse has a great chance at the Gold Cup. Right. I'm going to back it each way. And that's called? Flashing steel. What do you fancy in the big one? Um, it, it's obviously very hard to go against Shadami. I mean, he's class at all, right. written all over him, what have you. But uh, if I was to go against him, I would. I'd love Flashing Steel to do the business, but it, it's very hard to go against Shadami. I would back Flashing Steel without the favourite. Isn't that what they do? Flashing Steel without the favourite. <laughs> the favourite today is that it's St. Patrick's Day, and the favourite people here. Well, it's myself and Mr. Quinn at the moment. <laughs> and as we say, Slauncha. Slauncha. Henry Kelly and friends, uh, you'd have to say on day three, they look better preserved than the average Irishman. But now there are 15 horses going for the Gold Cup today for a first prize of over £118,000. The supporting races, the Daily Express Triumph Hurdle at 215, the Bonus Prince Dares Hurdle at 250, and the Christie's Fox Hunters starring Double Silk at five past four. Quality all the way. But there are five non-runners and a very important one. First in the first race, number five, Collier Bay, well fancied, is an absentee from the Daily Express Triumph Hurdle, so too is number 12, Flaming Miracle. In the Gold Cup, Ride Again has been pulled out. Number 15, That's the Life, is an absentee from the fifth race. And Dubicilla, many people's 
banker in the jackpot is lame. She misses the Cathcart Challenge Cup. What a disappointment. Any jackpot bets on her go on to the favourite. And Charlie Swan, as recommended by Peter Scudamore last Saturday, he looks home and hosed in the race for the Ritz Club Charity Trophy. His three winners put him clear of the field. Only Adrian Maguire has a realistic chance of catching him. Well, the Irish certainly had the best of it yesterday, and doesn't it show? But today, there are three possible good things on the card, and I think the local professionals are really going to get serious. Graham Rock's with me. Graham. Is the money on this morning, or are they waiting for the no, pack, no tax bets today? Uh, well, both is true, Julian. I think most of the Jadami punters are either on anti-post or they're going to wait and back it no tax here. My silver will be one of the biggest gambles of the year uh, in the offices up and down the country this morning. Three to one early with Labrokes that... Uh, we've got, sorry, we've got the uh, Gold Cup caption up now. I was well, talking about to my to silver. Jadami, okay. yeah. I mean, is he going to get shorter or longer? That's the question. Well, that all depends on what happens to my silver, in my opinion. If that gamble comes off, then Jadami will be short. But if the bookmakers get, him, get myself beaten, then I think you may be able to get six to four on the course. So my advice is very simply, if you fancy myself, back to Jodami now, the 11 to 8 is still there in places. Good reach way support for Bradbury Star looks sure to start second favourite. Nobody wants to back the fellow today. And some outsiders supported there, Docton's Express into 20 to 1, obviously the ground drying out. And uh, Topsham Bay was 200 to 1, uh, Chandler laid 1,000 each way at 150 to 1, now down to 100 to 1. Docklands Laws with Norman Wilkins, uh, Williamson would have ridden, of course. Now, the Stayers Hurdle at 250. Yes, a wide range of betting here. Balsani is favourite at 4 to 1 from 9 to 2. Triple Witching, popular each way choice, 6 from 7. The best money in the race, seeking cash, uh, was 9 to 1 in one or two outposts, 6 to 1, and tight at that price now. The Fox Hunters at five past four, a bit of a non-event in betting terms. Yes, I mean, double silks uh, scare them all away, unfortunately. 3 to 1 on. I think if you have to resort to that after the Gold Cup, you're really in trouble. And my Silv, who's been favoured for the Triumph Hurdle since December, you say very well back this morning. Yes, Ladbrokes went three to one and up and down the country and their betting shops laid her to lose about half a million pounds. Very well backed in all the offices up and down the country. Uh, good each way money for a lot of the outsiders. Devil's Den into 11, Glenstall flagship, the Irish horse. Probably best of the race that Moorish, a cash punter uh, of um, corals, went into the local betting shop down here and backed it to win 45,000 pounds. That's now 16 to one. So, myself, nine to four favourite, the filly owned by the Million and Mine Partnership Mark III, whose members include Peter O'Sullivan, no less. Uh, here she is, and Henry Kelly's been sharing their company. Well, I know it's St. Patrick's Day, but the first race today in the car to Cheltenham could be, fingers crossed, a triumph for the English, because there's a group of guys and gals called the Million and Mine Club, and they have one of the hottest anti-post favourites for any race ever. It's the Daily Express Triumph Hurdle, that's what it used to be called. It's the Triumph Hurdle. And the man in charge of all of this is David Minton. David, the horse name? Myself? My myself. Myself. I thought it was a pun on myself, named after you. Well, exactly. But Jack Fisher used to own his, his wife, right. called Sylvia, and he called it myself when he bought it a yearning. On my left here, Mrs. Mercy Rymel. Uh, we all remember the great Fred Rymel, of course. Mercy, what about this? Are you in this mob as well? Oh, I am, yes. Oh, yeah. Indeed I am. I love it. But are you part of the Million Mind group? Yes. Mercy, you used to be posh group. and sophisticated. You wouldn't oh. deal with... Oh. There was a time Mercy Rymel wouldn't deal with the lower uh, orders. Well, I'm, de I'm dealing with this mob now and I love it. Well, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Can I bring in another young lady here? Anne, Anne Moore? That's right. And you're yes. going to have to remind me, I, I know vaguely, but it's, it's, it's too many days at Cheltenham ago, but you have a great claim to fame, haven't you? I wouldn't say great I had a horse that had a great claim to fame. Which I was? A lovely horse called Sam who won a silver medal at the Munich Olympic Games. A silver medal at the yes, Munich Olympic right. Games. So you're one of the few people here who knows something about horses. I know and nothing <laughs> about horses. <laughs> and why did you get involved in this Million of Mine Club? Basically because we've been friends with David Minton and with right. David Nicholson for a long, long time. My husband and I, between us, would never have the chance to own a horse like myself. Right. And so we felt we had the best bloodstock agent in the business, we had the best trainer in the business. That's a fact. We had the best horse. <laughs> oh, uh, talk about uh, uh, hostages to fortune. Let's <laughs> the last word with David Minton. David, the great British public are out there watching you now. Now, no equivocations. Will this horse win? I certainly hope so. She deserves to. She's done nothing wrong all year. We just need the luck in running. We don't like words like hope and luck. We like certainties. Well, she'll win. She'll win. <laughs>
Good luck to Mindy. No, never a man to pull his punches there. And apologies to Peter O'Sullivan. Of course, the O'Sullivan connection is that she is bidding to become the first favorite to win this race since Ativo back in 1974. Well, my guests again are my two former champion jockey colleagues, Tommy Stack and Peter Scudamore. Tommy, you never won this, did you? <laughs> no, I didn't. I, 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 ran, I rode it enough at times to know what it takes to have a bad horse in it. It must be, what, nearly 25 years since you rode your first winner here? Or yeah, it's <laughs> more than 25 years, but uh, it was a horse owned by Mrs. Brother and her daughter, Anne, and trained by Bobby Renton, because I came over to them from Ireland, and uh, uh, they were very good to me, and they got me on the road. And, but unfortunately, Mrs. Brother, a great owner, died only recently, and uh, she was, she was marvellous, giving me a great start, and she used to own a great freebooter. And, uh, and so of course, a one stage owned Red Rum. That right, that's right, but yeah. she forgets about that. And uh, she, she was a great buyer of the Irish horse. She was a great supporter over the years, and they bought some great horse in Ireland. Yeah. Peter, you rode the winner on Solar Cloud. What type of horse is needed to win the race? Basically, I think you need a horse that stays well. You've got such a terrific gallop. Uh, it, it, it's an extraordinary race. There's no other race like it, especially for these young horses. Uh, all the other form, the previous form, you can throw the form book out of the window because whatever stays usually turns out to be a three-miler and they have got to gallop all the way to the line. Do you agree with Minty? Is she a good thing? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, she's got great credentials, but I, I'm repeating myself. You've got to throw the form book out of the window when it comes to this race. Right, well, she's just got 27 to beat. The full list of runners and riders of the Daily Express Triumph Hurdle comes from Peter S. Sullivan. Number one is Allegation, ridden by Martin Foster. Two, Atherton Green, Richard Guest. Three, Bagalino, Mark Perrett. Four, Blue Grotto, Ross Campbell. Six, Contract Elite, David Wilkinson. Seven, Daring Past, Peter Niven. Eight, Dare Dan, Mick Fitzgerald. Nine, Devil's Den, Graham Bradley. Ten, Doc Tour, change of colours this, Darren O'Sullivan. Eleven, Duveen, Carl Llewellyn. Thirteen, General Mukhtar, Graham McCourt. Fourteen, Glenstall Flagship, Rowland, Charlie Swan. Fifteen, Grant Nutt, Jamie Osborn. Sixteen, Catastrophe, Dylan Meredith. Seventeen, Carrar, Brendan Powell. Eighteen, Manila Bay, Davy Kavanagh. Nineteen, Monazite, Mark Richards. 20, Moorish, Declan Murphy, 21, My Valley Boy, Steve Smith-Eccles, 22, Noir, Jamie Railton, 23, Paper Days, Eamon Murphy, 24, Pridwell, Jonathan Lower, 25, Star Market, Trevor Ball, 26, Strictly Personal, Luke Harvey, 27, Winter Forest, Warren Marston, 28, Gunnar Sue, Simon McNeil, 29, Is My Silve, Adrian McGuire, and 30, for Ireland, uh, Shirley's Delight, written by Paul Carberry, and here's how they better the moment. And myself is the hot favourite here, 9 to 4, 10 to 1, Shirley's Delight and Pridwell, 11 to 1, Devil's Den and Glenstall Flagship, 12, Moorish, 14 to 1, Bagalino, 16 to 1, General Mukhtar, Groundnut and Catastrophe. And that's followed by 33 to 1, Daring Past, My Bally Boy and Winter Forest, 40 to 1, Nawar, Allegations 50 to 1 with Blue Grotto, Duveen, and Duck Tour. Then they bet 100 to 1 Contract Elite, Carrar, Paper Days, and Strictly Personal. Atherton Greens out to 200 to 1 with Diadan, Manila Bay, Monazite, Star Market, and Gunner Sue. Well, it's just one barrier of superstition to overcome, and that's that no horse has won the finale junior hurdle and the Daily Express Triumph hurdle, but then few have won the finale as easily as myself. Running down to the final flight now, and it looks bar a fall for this uh, brilliant three year old filly. My Silva under Adrian Maguire from Burnt in Pin second and Catastrophe third at the final flight. My Silva comes to it, jumps it clear of Burnt in who jumps it second, Catastrophe third, and striding up towards the line number 101 for Adrian Maguire, rerouted from Weatherby and at the line. My Silva is the winner, second is Burnt in. The filly described as the best jumper by David Nicholson that he's ever had, the best three-year-old anyway. Now, the best of the Irish. Tommy, this was your day yesterday, uh, last year rather. You picked out Shawia. What about this time? Well, the filly Shirley's delighted for me is the best of the Irish, but, uh, you know, she's a slightly made filly. If she gets, uh, if she jumps clear and, uh, and doesn't hit a hurl or get a hurl swinging back at her, I think she'll be concerned at the finish. Very good. Well, there are plenty to look at. Let's join Richard Pittman and Peter Scudamore in the paddock. 
Yes, fascinating race, isn't it? Shirley's Delight, one of three fillies in the race, and two of them are extremely well fancied, My Sylvan and Shirley's Delight. Um, don't uh, worry about fillies at this time of year, even though spring is round the corner, most of them uh, haven't started to think of, uh, of, of womenly things, and their, their form can be trusted <laughs> at this time of year. This is a nice animal skew going down very steadily, very relaxed. Yes, uh, <coughs> I didn't know that Philly's knit knitting you were talking about earlier, were you, Richard? That's but right. um, Paul Carberry, yes, rides this one for Noel Mead. We've talked about Paul already this season. Uh, he, he's an excellent jockey. I remember his father riding. He was a brilliant jockey himself. I think he was arrested one day for going... Uh, uh, speeding backwards down the high street in America or something when he would won the Colonial Cup, so he was quite a character. But uh, this horse, yes, it, it, it's very hard to evaluate the uh, Irish and English form, but uh, this comes in here with, with, with every chance. Yes, the only time she was beaten, uh, she was found to have an abscess under a tooth, and you can imagine yourself from the pain you have in the similar circumstances that an animal wouldn't give its best. The excitement here today has to be felt to be explained, honestly. The helicopters have been buzzing in like a swarm of wasps all day long. A lot of people here, and uh, with the weather as it is, we're in for a good race. And what a curtain raise of the Daily Express Triumph Hurdle. It's a, a very open race. Now, here is the favourite with her back to us. Look at the Diablo. Hasn't she got a nice, easy, loose walk there? She waddles up to the uh, first hurdle. You can see that she uses everything that she's got and uses it well. Adrian Maguire already with a winner in the frame for this meeting. We'll uh, play a tune. He'll be very handy on this filly early on. I doubt whether they'll let her dominate. She's two to one now from nine to four. More money in her favour. But Skew, her great thing has been relentless galloping. I've said already, you need a stayer to win this race. And that's, rather than the form before her, I think that's the, her great attribute. She's by Bastino, and a lot of his uh, progeny seem to improve with age. She seems to be improving age. The fact that she's going to race up there with the pace is also going to be in her favour, because this is one of the roughest races in the calendar. Uh, if you get in behind early on, especially down that inside, you get knocked about an awful lot. A lot of the senior jockeys, you'll see Steve Smith-Eccles and people like that, they'll go down middle outer, they'll lose a little bit of ground to have a decent run because if you get your momentum knocked out of you here you're in real trouble my soul by bustino number nine here we have devil's den martin pipe is uh, well represented in this race he'll need eyes in the back of his head but devil's den uh, came out first time with a big reputation and certainly didn't let uh, supporters down. I, I saw this horse win a claim, uh, claimer at York when it was uh, trained by Paul Kellaway. There, there was Nigel Tinkler, myself, uh, Martin Pipe. We were all up there trying to buy it and uh, Martin put the best claim in and he's been proved right and I think this has got an excellent chance. The softer the ground, w the better for this. So uh, the ground oh, might have gone a little bit against it. Yes. Uh, we've got uh, another pike horse that's fancied, Pridwell, who comes out only two days after running in the opener. Uh, that doesn't actually worry people too much, does it, Skiv? No, I think people that... When, when your horse is fit and well, you can run him twice a week. When your horse is wrong, you can't, if you run him once a year, it's, uh, it's too much for him. If they're fit and well, they, they, they uh, enjoy their racing and they come out of their racing. Where, there he is, uh, as uh, we saw him, ridden by uh, Jonathan Lauer. La uh, here on Tuesday to finish second. Jonathan, I've said before, he's a tremendous rider, good horseman. There's a lot of the schooling for Martin Pipe at home and a lot of Martin's success is down to the hard work that Jonathan puts in. And this horse is 11 to 1 from 10s. He's by the Stallion Saddle as well, who stands at Coolmore at 100,000 uh, uh, quid for the service fee. <laughs> They wouldn't have planned for it to end up here, but they'll still be pleased with any winner, and especially one of this, uh, this degree. There in the uh, middle of the picture with the red cap is number three, Bagalino. This horse had his uh, tongue tied down last time he ran. Now you can just see it there. Some people put a leather strap on, and that looks like a lady's stocking. I don't know whether Amanda Harwood has uh, removed her stockings in the paddock and uh, tied, them, uh, tied the tongue down. Now, I never think this makes much difference, Richard. I know once the horse is starting gargle, will you tie their tongue down or not, uh, they're still going to gargle. It's pressure that makes them gargle, not uh, stopping them by tying their tongue down. 
Yes, it does seem to work, though, in some occasions. And I know Michael Dickinson, I saw him working his horse in America, tied a lot of them down when he worked them. Anyway, this horse, Bagalino's done precious little wrong so far this season. And I know that Guy Harwood, I saw him yesterday, was very perky in the lift going up to the fifth floor. Uh, this one beat Collier Bay, who doesn't run, of course, today, that beat it quite convincingly at Sandown, and that was its last run. Now, take a look at that crowd. Amongst them, we have the bookmakers to the left of the picture. And in the ring, would you believe, we've got Rocky. And the gamble on my silve is developing all the time. It opened at 5-2 to two down here and now 2-1. to one. Bets of 15,000 to 6, 10,000 to 4. More bets of 5,000 to 2 than you can count. Yeah. Best back to... Best back to the remainder would be the Irish horse Glenstall flagship, yeah, as low as nine to one in places, but my silver's the one the punters want. Yes, plenty of money around here in the ring at Cheltenham, and it flies in both directions. Well, in the orange colours, Glenstall flagship, the one that uh, has just been spoken about. Joseph Crowley uh, owns this, and his son-in-law, Aidan, trains it. Now, this animal is unbeaten in uh, two runs, and as you'd expect, is by the stallion Glenstall. Charlie Swan's on board, and he's easily leading for the Ritz Club yes. trophy. This is a half-brother to Viking flagship. I said it was a full-brother to Viking flagship, but obviously Viking flagship's by Viking, and this horse is by Glenstall. Takes a lot of working out, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> so, Glenstall flagship winner at Punchestown and also at Navan. And no mean performer either on the level there. He was a runner over a mile and a half. Tens to one from 11 to one. <laughs> Askew Moorish is an animal here, number 20 in the Diablo, the red and grey there. Now, this is ridden by Declan Murphy, but I happen to know that Adrian Maguire would have been very pleased to have ridden this if my silver had not been lining up. Yes, this is by the uh, prodigious uh, sire at Dominion, who unfortunately uh, died not so long ago, but he's had some very, very high-class hurdlers. Martin Pipe always buys his uh, uh, sires, uh, horses by this sire when he can. Um, he pulled, a lot of them pull hard, and I think you'll see Declan Murphy settling this horse in. He was beaten first time he ever ran at Leicester by another runner in this uh, track, Noir. Right, let's take a final check on the top six. My Silve is twos and firm. Shirley's Delight drifted out to tens. The same price, Glenstall, who flagships come in two points. Pridwell is 11s. The same price, Devil's Den, 12 to 1 Moorish. And you can have 14 to 1 and up to 200s the rest. Well, it looks as if this very exciting race will be off very shortly. Peter, all yours. Yes, the 28 runners spreading across the course for this 30th running of the... Triumph Hurdle under Daily Express sponsorship. Blue Grotto just a little bit out of the back at the moment. So is Carrar. That's daring past uh, turning towards the right. This here, this uh, Carrar to get in and join the others as we see them from the rear at the moment. And that's it, they're away. And as they jump off, Glenstall flagship is one of the first to show as they come to the first flight. Glenstall flagship is over in the lead from Catastrophe. Then on the near side is Doctor with Daring Past right up with them too. And My Silve and My Silve has just about taken it up now in the centre. It's My Silve from Catastrophe and, and uh, Glenstall flagship over on the far side. Then Doctor and Daring Past. Just in behind them come Duveen. And also making good progress up towards the lead is Atherton Green. But it's my silver, the leader, from Catastrophe and Atherton Green and Glenstall flagship over on the far side. Doctor on the near side. And all safely over that second flight. And uh, making their way out into the country now with my silver joined by Atherton Green. Atherton Green just shading my silver at the moment as they go out into the country with Doctor Third. Four comes Catastrophe and then Glenstyle flagship. Then just in behind them, Ground Nut. On the outside of Ground Nut is Star Market. Just behind Star Market, it's uh, Allegation. Noir, right up there with um, Atherton Green, not far behind, and My Silve on the outside, Glenstall flagship. Noir and Jamie Railton 
with the advantage over this flight from Mysilf, Catastrophe, Glenstall flagship, then Doctor, then Ground Nut. Running to the fifth flight. Noir and Mysilf, these two together. Glenstall flagship is in third, daring pass, making good progress under Peter Niven towards the outside with Catastrophe next, and then comes Pridwell, who's made ground. But it's Noir, three out, and Mysilf. Mysilf lands in the lead from Noir, then daring pass, then Catastrophe. Then Glenstall flagship on the inside. Pridwell, Doctor's not far behind them. My Bally Boy is making good progress. As they run down towards the next. Two left to jump now. My Sylve, Nawar. Then comes Daring Past. Then Glen Style flagship. Doctor comes next with on the outside catastrophe and then Pridwell still making quite good ground. Mysilf the leader as they come towards the second last. Mysilf from Daring Past over on the far side. Glenstall flagship moves into third. Mysilf is going to jump the second last in the lead. Mysilf is over. Daring Past. Glenstall flagship making ground towards the outside is Blue Grotto. They're racing now towards the home turn. Moorish is coming there with quite a good run too and it's Glenstall flagship for Ireland on the far side. My Silva in the centre. My Silva and Glenstall flagship from Pridwell putting in a good run. Then comes Moorish racing now towards the final flight and it's My Silva and Glenstall flagship Catastrophe putting in a renewed challenge as they come to the last. My Silf lands in the lead at the last. It's My Silf, the leader from Morris, putting in a run under Declan Murphy. But My Silf is holding them all as they race up towards the line. My Silf is going to win the Daily Express Triumph Hurdle. My Silf is the winner. Second is Morris. Third is Shirley's Delight. And fourth is Blue Grotto. That's the one, two, three, four in the 1994 Daily Express Triumph Hurdle. The result. First, number 29, Mysilv. Owned by the Million in Mind Partnership Mark III. Trained by David Nicholson and written by Adrian Maguire. Second was number 20, Moorish. Owned by Mr. Adrian Fitzpatrick and Mrs. M. Horan. Trained by John White and written by Declan Murphy. And third was number 30, Shirley's Delight. Owned by Mr. Liam Doherty. Trained by Noel Mead and written by Paul Carberry with fourth, number four, Blue Grotto. Adrian Maguire's second winner of the meeting. He's still got a chance of catching Charlie Swan for the championship of the meeting. But what a brave performance by this filly. Always up there in the driving seat, out of trouble, which is a, a great asset. There was quite a lot of trouble behind her in the race, but she kept galloping all the way to the line. Now, they look like challenge and are going to the last, Richard. Yes, indeed. A bit of trouble behind Pridwell got a bump at the last uh, uh, hurdle there. But some horses have run brilliantly just out of the money. But this one has left them for dead. Another British bred horse here, bred by Tim Holland Martin's Overy Stunt, by Bustino, as you said. And uh, we're doing holding our own up here, and it's uh, <laughs> often a very difficult thing to do. But she gallops all the way to the line. What a super filly. Well made, a lot of confidence behind her. She's won how a filly should win. And she's won from another filly there, Shirley's delight who's by be my native and uh, Paul Carberry on board that one but the Phillies abs just absolutely. being congratulated there by the stable companion and Warren Marston riding that but uh, the, what a great result for racing all lots of little people involved in the race well little people lots of not what I'm trying to say is that it's not a, a lot of money to get into a syndicate like this and what a great deal of fun you can have it she will get as big a reception as that Denoli because there's more owners Richard Yes, exactly. I think the place will erupt, and some very powerful owners do. But isn't she a lovely, big, loose walking filly, as we pointed out beforehand? She uses everything she's got. I must correct myself there, of course, Shirley's Delight was third, not second. Moorish was second, and that was the other one that Adrian Maguire could have ridden and uh, said he wouldn't have minded doing so. Uh, here he's getting plenty of pats from everyone. My Sylve went off 
the two to one favourite. Now that may look very generous now, but when you consider 28 ran, well, uh, she's won like a good thing should win. She's put the Colts in their place in no uncertain fashion. So that opens things up a bit now in the jockey's title with uh, Adrian on two, and you know, Charlie's just ahead of him. Yes, Adrian's got some very good uh, rides later on. I uh, know the, st the stable strongly fancy triple witching in the next. He's got a mini homer in the uh, Gold Cup. He's not without a chance. So uh, it's still all to play for. And remember that a filly won this race last year in Shawia, you know, so uh, people who are breathing them will be very happy. There's David Nicholson's travelling head, head lad. He's uh, Jeremy Willis. He's been with the yard a very long time, and uh, that's him in his uh, blue trilby there, just throwing the uh, sheet across them. It's, it, horses, these are athletes, and when, they, uh, when they're cooling down, you mustn't let their, colds get, their muscles get cold. Yes, and there's Anne Moore, the former show jumper, rushing in to kick, di kiss Dicko Dick, another of the uh, uh, members who comes from the show jumping fraternity in this horse. But you'll be amazed when you see them come into the ring here. So many familiar faces have got into this big partnership. Myself, two to one favourite. Moorish second at 12 to one. Shirley's Delight at 10 to one filled the third spot. And Blue Grotto came from nowhere, 50 5 out of 1 was 4. Well, David Nicholson is just behind. Big grin, as you would expect. The Duke of Condicate that used to be now the Duke of Jack Dawes Castle. I would say that if uh, all the members send him a tenor as uh, a well done, he'll be a very wealthy man after today. But the Duke, who on occasions can be pontificate and very abrasive, is a very sentimental man when it comes to horses and also his fellow trainers. And I should think he'll be one of the first to go off to the placed horses connections to congratulate them. Take a check from the head on. Now look here, Skew, because Pridwell is on the right of the picture and he gets a bump. Yes, uh, Jonathan's trying to go up the inner there. Um, he's, he's had every room to do so, but the horse has dived a little bit at the last there, and it's uh, given him no chance. He's out of picture now, but uh, let's watch a great jockey coming up this hill. She's just beginning to drift right. Adrian's very quick in pulling her stick through, so she doesn't uh, affect anybody, but uh, there she is, her ears back, and she's, that means she's really trying and galloping to the line. When she pulls up, uh, you can see Adrian thump in the air now, and her ears are pricked as we saw her walking in. There they go, she knows she's won, and if you tell me that horses don't enjoy racing sometimes, they always enjoy winning, anyway. <laughs> I think they enjoy racing. They're bred to gallop, and you put two besides each other, and they actually spur each other on. No, racehorses are bred to gallop, they enjoy doing it. David Nicholson will be very hot under that sheepskin coat, but he won't mind whatever uh, warm odours come up from underneath it. It's his lucky coat, and it's proved so yet again today. David Minton's got uh, the bloodstock agent who formed the syndicate. He's got a tremendous record here at uh, Cheltenham. He's bought a lot of winners, and uh, I'm sure his order books, books will be full for uh, the next Newmarket autumn sales, where this filly came from. Uh, he's bought horses such as Crebensis, who went on and uh, won the champion hurdle. He's bought other triumph winners. He's bought Saxon Farm, first bout, and alone its success. And now she's become the first horse, to, I think, since Ativo to be favourite uh, to, to win this race. I think that's right. I'm sure Peter O'Sullivan will correct us if we're wrong. Yes, that's certainly right, Peter. And what a reception. She's got 160 owners. Now this great little mare who's now won all her six races over hurdles. David Nicholson said from the outset of the season that he reckoned her superior to Broadsword, who was a runner-up in the Triumph some years ago. And he was a pretty good horse himself. Now Adrian Maguire really in the fighting line now for the Ritz Club Charity Trophy because Although Charlie Swan leads him by one, uh, the places in the, in the event of a dead heat uh, are significant. And uh, Charlie Swan has ridden three winners and one fourth. Adrian has now ridden two winners, a second, a third, and a fourth. So if he, at the moment, if he had another winner, he'd actually be in front of, uh, of Charlie Swan. These two Irishmen... Uh, and a battle it out, and uh, David Nicholson, the Duke, goes to scale with his brilliant young rider who's now won six races 
in all at the National Hunt meeting. Went to the meeting having won uh, a Cathcart, a Grand Annual, and a Gold Cup and a Kim Muir. Yes, all sorts of chaotic scenes down here in the weighing room, around the weighing room, Million in Mind partnership and, and the brains behind it, David Minton and, and dozens of supporters. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. It was, it was a very exciting. She was marvellous. Agent just came in and said anything that took her on, he wanted to kick them. So. <laughs> how many of you own this filly? 160 of us. And how many of you are here? 160. <laughs> Another silly question. How many of you have backed her? <laughs> And at 33 to 1. 33 to 1, you pitched the price. 33 to 1, yeah. And this, this was, as they say, the plan. It was planned from a long way off, yeah. And we've been waiting for this. I would have rather gone for the champion, but the Duke overruled me, so. And so did all the shareholders. Yes. Do explain to us, please, the benefits of syndication rather than perhaps owning a horse on your own or a half share. It's fantastic to be a syndicate owner, and you do get involved in racing. All of us, we are a big family and David gets us all together and it is a really fantastic way to be involved with racehorses. Excellent. It's marvellous. Is it true that when you went to Jack Dawes Castle you drank the Duke out of house and home? Uh, <laughs> we had a bloody good we had a good time. It's not very easy. He was, a, he was a fantastic host to all of us. He's a gentleman to us all. He was. Excellent. It's a great result to David, of course, under the scheme that you have, all these horses have to be sold at the end of the year. Will she go to the sales? I'm afraid she will, but there's a few plans afoot to keep her. Yes. But we've got to stick to our rules. With a bit of luck, she'll be back next year in another syndicate uh, bearing really much the same I really hope so, yeah. Wait I'd love to see her, yeah. <laughs> a lovely result for you and for racing. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, congratulations to them all. Quite true, they had 33 to 1 last December before she won at Cheltenham. After that, she was 16 to 1. She was 10 to 1 when she won at Chepstow. She's always been backed all the way down until finally they're backed at 3 to 1 this morning. And what a win they've all had. Only the second filly to win the Triumph Hurdle since it's been run at Cheltenham. And uh, the first was, in fact, Shawea 12 months ago. Two fallers in the race, Daya Dan and My Ballet Boy, will bring you news of those when we have it. And here now, the starting prices. First, number 29, My Sil, 2 to 1 favourite. Second, number 20, Moorish, 12 to 1. Third, number 30, Shelley's Delight, 10 to 1. And fourth, number 4, Blue Grotto, 55 0 to 1. The outside meetings, Hexham, first of all, 2 o'clock there, won by number 5. Here comes Tibby, 9 to 2. And second was number two, a bit of a natter, 20 to one, only two of four finished. And the flat race at Lingfield, the 210, first number four, Nordico Princess, 15 to eight. Second number six, Paliscade Joes, four to one. And third number two, Monsieur Petain, eight to one. Well, yesterday was a triumph for the legendary Irish bookmaker and punter J.P. McManus, alias the Sundance Kid. He had two colossal gambles and he had two winners in his own colours, the latter of which was the talking horse of the day, the buzz horse, Muckle Meg, who was favoured for the Bromsgrove Industries Festival bumper. She was back to five to one in the morning whilst one or two people got on and back down on the course to two to one before she drifted out to seven to two at the off. There was never much danger that they'd collect. John Hanmer is the commentator. Muckle Megs come through very strongly on the inside with Aries Girl, Maringo led for such a long way, still not far behind them. Another one making ground is Go Ballistic, but on the final turn it's Muckle Meg, Muckle Meg and Charlie Swan going very easily in the lead from in second place. We've got Aries Girl and they're clear and one running on from a long way back is Dominique Go Ballistic's improving and now Muckle Meg comes under pressure as Aries Girl comes at him, but Muckle Meg is finding it as they run into the final furlong. Muckle Meg from Aries Girl, then Go Ballistic, Maringo and Rhythm Section, but coming up towards the line, Muckle Meg is going to win it for Ireland. Aries Girl is second for Ireland, and back in third place is Go Ballistic. So the gamble was landed, a first, second and fourth for the Irish. They've won the race in all three years since its inception. Edward O'Grady was the trainer there. 
Well, before that, there was the Mild Mayor Fleet Handicap Chase, and there were four Grand National acceptors in that race, including Elfast, Elfast who won the race two years ago, and there was a bet of 40,000 to five about him yesterday. And the bet was landed. Coming to the third last, and Man of Mystery, the leader, from Dublin Flyer on the inside. Elfast on the outside right there with them. And then French Charmer and Dublin Flyers come through on the inside to take it up again from Man of Mystery, Elfast, French Charmer, then Smarty Express, Names Tycoon, 4th of July and Nevada Girl making ground. Over two out, Man of Mystery and Dublin Flyer together. French Charmer was the one who fell. And on the home turn with one to jump, Dublin Flyer, challenged now by Elfast, Man of Mystery. Can't do any more in third place and it's Elfast who comes to the last. Elfast from Dublin Flyer, and these two going on now from Smarty Express. Elfast dives to the right of the last Dublin Flyer, jumps it well, gives him half a chance, but Elfast is staying on well, and Dublin Flyer's coming back at him. Smarty Express back in third, Elfast and Graham McCourt, Dublin Flyer and Brendan Powell, and Elfast just holds on. Elfast is the winner, Dublin Flyer second, Smarty Express third. Elfast, a hugely courageous winner. He was in great form this morning, 100% sound. He's now on track for the Martel Grand National best price at 33 to 1. We're now back to the first race here at Cheltenham today. The presentation's about to take place. Richard Pittman's going to describe it. Yes, and it's a very packed ring down there with so many of the part owners in there. Uh, they really have been having some fun with this animal, and now the filly has come good here at the championship race for four-year-olds. They've seen all their dreams come true. Syndicate managers everywhere now will be on to their shareholders and uh, encouraging them. Well, the presentation is by Lord Stevens of Ludgate, chairman of Express Newspapers, and uh, he will be presenting the trophy, and it's a very handsome bronze too, to Mrs. Priscilla Hastings, who is the mother-in-law of Ian Balding, the royal trainer. So she is representing the 160 shareholders here in this horse. Lord Stevens uh, just presenting now. He's on the left of the picture. And uh, Priscilla Hastings, I think, in fact, I know, is a member of the Jockey Club. So it's uh, good to see that members of the Jockey Club are getting involved in uh, syndicated horses because one tends to think of them owning strings of them themselves, don't you? So she is very involved in all sorts of committees and uh, does sterling work for horse racing in general. So down amongst the melee, Jonathan Powell has got Adrian Maguire. Okay. Yes, with me, Adrian Maguire, who is surrounded by pressmen now, but also 150 or so owners of this smashing mare. How did the race go for you? Well, the main thing, Jonathan, was to jump out and get a good start because there's so many runners in it. If you happen to be behind one or two at the first, you know, you know God knows what, what might have happened. So we jumped out, jumped out up there. I think I'm nearly one of the first jumping the first. And from there on, then, I was just sat and held onto her head and let her gallop at her own pace. Uh, she's, you know, she's jumped very well all the way. I think I've missed maybe one. The only reason she's missed one is because she's going so quick. But... Um, you know, she was very good all the way. The last three quarters of the race is almost a flat race, isn't it? Just a couple of hurdles. So you had to make that jumping count, didn't you? Yeah. Um, my governor says, it, like, try and get a breeder at the top of the hill. And um, I sat as quiet as I could and um, to get her to fill herself up. She's, she's got a win. We travelled down the hill and jumped to the second last pretty well. And um, still just holding on to her head, turning in. And once we turned in, then I could, I could hear them all. I could hear a couple of horses behind me. I happened to look around and I could hear them just on my heels so once we straightened up uh, we kicked for home and like she's just galloped up that hill if it wasn't there she's really quickened away from the others isn't she yeah she's unbelievably you know it's unbelievable how tough she is um i'm not sure what the name of the horse was jamie railson he made it for a while and i've um i overtook him then and he's come back again at me but um once he's come back again at me she's put her ears flat on the back of her head and stuck her head out she didn't want to be passed hey doing how did she compare with the best novices you've ridden well I've been saying all along this season she's the best novice I've ever ridden and um, she still was going to be the best novice if, if I was going to get beat today. She's definitely the best and probably the best I'll ride for a long, long time. Well done. Thank you. Thanks. Well, well done, Adrian Maguire. And uh, well, he said that to us at Chepstow last December, so no excuse for anyone not being on. Well, now this is a very important time for the tote. They're part of a consortium, they're 27.5% in fact of a consortium who are bidding to become the 
firm that run the new imminent national lottery. They're also, at present, in the throes of creating a new super bet, which is designed to underpin the finances of racing in the late 1990s. The so chairman is Lord Wyatt of Weyford. Lord Wyatt, how realistic are your ambitions to run the national lottery? Well, we've got a chance, like uh, some of the others. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed. We think we've done our best, we've worked very hard, and, uh, but of course the Director General will choose entirely on the basis of which consortium is most likely to achieve the results he wants, which is the maximum of the National Lottery and good causes. Now, how damaging do you think the advent of the National Lottery is going to be to betting on racing? Well, it could be very severe. Um, uh, in France and elsewhere, where they've had a National Lottery introduced, it usually drops by about 10%, the betting in the betting shops. Well, roughly £10 million is bet on horse racing every day in this country. What do you feel would be the weekly take of the National Lottery? Uh, well, I think for very long, the National Lottery ought to be taking something like uh, 4,000 million, 4 billion a year. And uh, so you will have to work that out for yourself. But I think it may take a few months. Well, that's a staggering sum. If you fail to win the lottery concession, or even if you do, obviously the next target for racing is the new super bet. Now, what sort of shape do you envisage, visualize that taking? Well, first of all about super bets. Um, we've got a super bet arriving with the tote now, and you've got a huge jackpot today. It may it'll certainly get to somewhere around 600,000, and that's happening more and more frequently. We're guaranteeing it, and it's happening more and more because we established with Bass, uh, who own Coral, the partnership uh, called Tote Direct, and these terminals are going out into all the betting shops, or many betting shops, and the more they, they get, the bigger they pool. And so this is what it, we're seeing the effect now. But sadly, it does only happen about three times a year, this sort of half million pounds. Ah, it'll happen far more often uh, where, uh, when, when the rollout has completed it. I, I confidently expect that by the end of October this year, There'll be four to five thousand betting shops which will either have our terminals to date direct or be have asked for them. And that's going to be one hell of a big business. There was an earlier edition of uh, the Super Bet, it was the tote roll up in the 1970s. It failed. Why do you think that was? For several reasons. Uh, one was that uh, the races were contrived in such a way that everybody knew there were about six or seven non triers. <laughs> so they just come for their parents' money, and so they struck them out. And then uh, uh, the pool got in disenchanted with it because it took up a certain amount of space on their coupon. And you know, like, it's like a shop. And they thought, right, well, that item isn't selling well enough. And it was just, I think it was in their success when they decided to, 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 to stop it. How well has the tote been performing at Cheltenham this week? Brilliantly. Uh, we could probably get a record haul in, in the three days here, uh, and uh, it, it partly due to Tote Direct uh, because of the play spot. And we've never guaranteed play spot before at a quarter of a million, which we've done today, and we'll get it. And uh, we, we got uh, nearly that on the first two days. Or, uh, so I think once we got more. And so uh, it, it's booming away because, you see, at last we've got, we've got the most advanced bet wagering technology in the world. There's no doubt about that. And it's now cheap enough for people to be able to use it properly. And people have said to me before, why didn't you do it earlier? The answer was the state of the art wasn't there. And we could have done it in a clumsy and efficient way, which would have been very, very mistaken. But now we can do it. And we spent a lot of money doing it. And the results are now coming in. Well, it is a fact that people have said over the years that the tote has been underperforming. Do you feel that tote direct is the answer to that well, problem? Well, of course, it's one of the answers, but we've never been underperforming, underperforming, as you call it. We've done, we've done a great deal, considering the government tied our hands behind the, our backs by uh, letting the, uh, the ordinary betting shops have 11 years start on us in the high street. And uh, everything the government has done has been, on the whole, against us. And all we've ever done to the government is give them money. We've never had a halfpenny from them. We pay them a lot in uh, betting duty and corporation tax, and we've had not one halfpenny ever from them. Why should you be different to the rest of us? <laughs> we all pay them money. <laughs> Lord Wyatt, what's going to win the Tote Gold Cup? Uh, the young hustler. Lord Wyatt, there, the indestructible chairman of the Tote. 
Now, one bit of sad news, I'm afraid, from the first race, that my ballet boy, who fell at the third last, I'm afraid, was fatally injured. The two jockeys, however, uh, have no serious injuries. Now on to the second race of Gold Cup Day. It's the bonus print champion stayers hurdle. Runners and riders from Peter. 14 of them. And number one is Avro Anson, Mark Dwyer. Two, Balassani, Mark Perrett. Three, Bart Earn for Ireland, Graham Bradley. Four, Burgoyne, Peter Nevin. Five, Cardinal Red, Simon McNeil. He's a birthday boy today. Six is Desert Force, Tony Carroll. Seven, Minella Lad for Ireland, written by Trevor Horgan. Eight is Pregada, Charlie Swan. Nine, Seek in Cash, Jamie Osborne. Ten, Simpson, Tom Grantham. Eleven, Sweet Duke, Carl Llewellyn. Twelve, Sweet Glow, Jonathan Lur. Thirteen, Triple Witching, Adrian Maguire. And fourteen, Deb's Ball, Jimmy Moffat. And Balassani is the favourite here at four to one. Then they bet five seeking cash and Sweet Duke, eleven to two triple witching, six Manila Lad, eight Avro Anson and Simpson, ten to one Pregada, twenty to one Sweet Glow, thirty-three to one Bart Owen, thirty-three to one Bourgogne, forty to one Deb's Ball, a hundred to one Cardinal Red, and Desert Force is five hundred to one. Still no winner for Martin Pipe at the festival, but this horse has always looked his best chance of the week, Balassani, a horse with the quality to win the Ascot Stakes on the flat. And requested, headed now by Bardolf, then Snowboard, then comes star player, Doyce is making ground, Rosina May's trying to get on terms, Balassani is coming with a run wide, and they've got a furlong and a half to race. And it's all go up front, and here's star player bursting through with snowboard. Balassani coming wide with Doyce into the final furlong, and Balassani out wide from star player Doyce, then snowboard, and coming from a long way back, Mardu, but Balassani and Mark Perrett have quick and clear to win this readily as they come to the line. Balassani is the winner. Mark Perrett was the jockey that day, as he is today. Jonathan Powell of the Sunday Express has been speaking to him. Well, that was the first part of a very unusual double that you were attempting at Royal Ascot. What do you remember about that day? Fantastic day. Um, we'd have to compare to, to riding a winner here. Um, very lucky to be able to have done it. Let's hope I can carry on the double today. And he certainly stayed very well that day. He settled well and he came with a strong late run. Would that be the similar sort of plan you try today? Hopefully so, yes. Uh, in all his hurdle races that I've ridden him, um, and he's he's run well. He needs to be settled in. Well, not that he pulls that hard, but he just loves to come late and off a strong gallop. He quickens up really well. You know, um, he possibly just idles a bit in front if he's in front too soon. You know, that's the only reason he hasn't sort of taken it up before. And Mark, any doubt in your mind about this stiffer three miles that he he will truly get the trip? I think he'll get the trip. Obviously, you know, um, all his hurdle winning and what have you has, has been on flatter tracks and he hasn't ever won round Cheltenham, but, um, you know, he won round Ascot, which is uh, as stiff as you would, would get, you know. Um, I can't really see that it's that much of a problem if he gets beat. I don't think it'll be because of the course, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there he is, Balassane, the pipe banker of the week. But there are several others fancied. Amongst them is Triple Witching. There he is. Triple Witching, who last autumn was far too good for Sweet Duke at Newbury. Good noises coming out of Jack Dawes Castle about tri Triple Witching. And uh, here on the left is uh, Triple Witching under Adrian Maguire with the orange colours on the right. Makes this horse on £7 better terms today, uh, so there's not going to be much between them. He didn't jump the last very well there at Sweet Duke, so he can get a little bit closer to them. But uh, really on this form you could see Triple Witching just uh, being a length or two too good for Sweet Duke. But uh, they're both good horses and they're both being at the shout at the end. And just running into the back of the picture there is Burgoyne, who also reopposes both of them. Triple Witching was getting seven pounds from Sweet Duke that day, but uh, I'd have to agree with Skew that the win was emphatic. And the joker in the pack, 
Well, that's seeking cash. Recently changed hands, now in Mrs. Thompson's colours. Still a novice, but unbeaten in four races, and his form is rock solid. This was his second run over hurdles, then wearing green colours at Newbury on New Year's Day, and he simply annihilated to the woods, who ran pretty well till he fell in the second last at uh, yesterday's Sun Alliance, and uh, he comes to this race unbeaten. Tommy, does he impress you? Yes, I think he's, he, he, he's a good horse, a good novice. Uh, people thought he would have gone for the two-and-a-half-mile novice with poor other with the performance of Danoli yesterday, probably pleased he didn't. But he looks a good horse. They say no five-year-old has ever won this race. Well, records are there to be broken. <laughs> of course, no filly had ever won the crown till last year. Let's now join Richard Pepper. Yes, statistics are there to be changed, Julian, aren't they? Well, seeking cash is... Uh, on a roll, his four wins have been very emphatic indeed. I just wonder if the ground has dried up a little bit for him. We're looking now back again at the favourite. Balasani comes late and fast, number two there. He has to be held up. He's four to one favourite from seven to two, and he has a devastating turn of foot. I just slightly wonder, three miles and a half furlong, very stiff track. I know he's won two and a half miles on the flat, but Kempton was a lot easier track than he won on last time. I think that the fact that uh, he's won over two and a half mile at Ascot, I think you get the trip. I remember riding him as, as a novice over hurdles, and uh, Martin was worried then what trip was his best trip, and I always felt three miles was his best trip. So, as the runners circle, let's go down into a far busier ring and see Rocky. And bookmakers down here are facing a payout of over a million pounds up and down the country on that first winner, myself. Easily the best backed horse of the morning so far. Down here in our stairs, race Balasani now looking easy, drifting all the while out to 92 in places. Better, better money arriving for seeking cash. Now 92 in some places from as high as 9 to 1 this morning. That's the story down from the ring. Yes, and here we see one that's very close to your heart, Skew, Sweet Duke, number 11 in the uh, white and blue. Sweet by name, sweet by nature, lovely little horse. You could uh, put your children into the stable with this horse and uh, all you do is say hello to him. He's been uh, a grand servant to his owner, Andy Mavro, and the trainer, Nigel Twiston Davis. Uh, he was fourth in this race last year. It'd be lovely to see him uh, put up another bold show. He performs best on the heavy ground. We've seen him uh, running many times on television this time. Last time he ran, he had a heavy weight at Sandown of a two mile five, a race won by Dark Honey, but uh, I think I was pleased with that run and I think he'll go very close today. Well, they're coming in. Peter, Balasani is 9 to 2, the same price seeking cash, 5 Sweet Duke, 11 to 2 Triple Witching, 15 to 2 Manila Lad, Avro Anson at 8, 9 Simpson, 11 Pregada. Peter. And running towards the first of the 12 flights and uh, seeking cash, the novice, one of those up front with Pregada on the inside and Sweet Duke on the outer. And Barto in, all safely over the first with Desert Force, uh, one of the back markers. And Manila Lad going on now as they come to the second with uh, Sweet Duke. Sweet Duke, Manila Lad, and Pregada on the inside. Sweet Duke and Pregada landed just ahead of Manila Lad there. And then Seekin Cash on the inside. Bardo in on the outer. Triple Witching just in behind them. Over the third, Pregada. And Sweet Duke. Sweet Duke going on from Pregada. Seeking Cash and Manila Lad and Triple Witching on the inside. Bart Owen just in behind them. As they race towards the fourth, Pregada. Burns in the lead, but uh, doesn't jump it too well and is out jumped, in fact, by Sweet Duke and uh, the novice seeking Cash, but fighting his way back now to dispute the lead once again. In fact, to take it up marginally, Pregada from, in second place, uh, Sweet Duke. Then on the inside, uh, Seekin Cash. Bart Owen comes next, followed by Manila Laird and Triple Witching. And then Sweet Glow. Quite a long run to the next flight. Pregada. And uh, Charlie Swan with the advantage from Bart Owen over on the far side. Sweet Duke close with them as they come to flight number five. Manila Lad on the far side and then seeking cash. 
beginning the swing into the home straight on this first circuit. And Bart Allen has taken it up now from Pregada and Sweet Duke and Manila Lad, and then Seek and Cash. And just in behind Seek and Cash is Simpson. Desert Force is the back marker with Deb's ball one from last. Number six of the 12 flights in all, Bart Owen. Lands in the lead from uh, Sweet Duke and Manila Lad and Pregada. Then on the far side, uh, Seek and Cash. Cardinal Red comes next. Behind him, Avro Anson and Triple Witching and Balasani going well. Then Simpson. Then Sweet Glow. Behind Sweet Glow, Burgoyne, Debs Ball and Desert Force, the back marker, and Barto in the leader. Reminders there for Pregado, who's lost several places as they run down to the next. The seventh. Barto in Sweet Duke and Manila Lad. We're over it in that order. From Cardinal Red, with Seek and Cash on the inside, Triple Witching and Balasani getting closer. Avro Anson's making quite good progress too. Coming to the ninth, Bart Owen on the inside of Sweet Duke. Manella Lad on the far side. Cardinal Red running a good race with Avro Anson just in behind him. In comes Seekin Cash, triple witching. Simpson on the outside. Balasani still tucked in behind uh, Seekin Cash. Three out this is. Bart Owen. Mistake by Seekin Cash, the novice there. Bart Owen, the leader from Sweet Duke and Manila Lad over on the far side. Three is three. There's very little between them now. Back in fourth is Avro Anson, then Simpson, Cardinal Red losing ground now. Bart Owen and Graham Bradley, the leader, as they round this top turn and begin the descent. Bart Owen from Sweet Duke, Manila Lad, Simpson, Balasani's traveling strongly in behind the lead. Avro Anson's very prominent also. Bart Owen lost ground there, and Sweet Duke went on from Manila Lad. Sweet Duke towards the far right as we see them now from Manila Lad. Manila Lad just landed in the lead there in the fall of his triple witching. And it's Manila Lad from Avro Anson now and Sweet Duke. Avro Anson traveling very strongly. They've got one flight left to jump in the bonus sprint stayers hurdle. Manila Lad for Ireland and Avro Anson for the north of England. Just in behind them, Balasani. Mark Perrot is poised in behind him under pressure is Sweet Duke. They've got still a long run to the last flight. Over on the far side, Manila Lad, Avro Anson beginning to hold out distress signals now. Manila Lad on the far side, Avro Anson still in close contention though at the last. Avro Anson lands in the lead from Manila Lad, Balasani just in behind them and Avro Anson pulling out more and more as he races towards the line. It's Avro Anson, the leader from Manila Lad who hampers the uh, hampers Balasani. Balasani putting in a tremendous run. Balasani beginning to get up, it's going to be close and at the line. It's a photo. Avro Anson may have just held Balasani within third place, Manila Lad, and fourth was Simpson. It's a photo. And my goodness, if Balasani has lost this, he, he will be an unlucky horse, but it's very, very close indeed, and he may have got up in the dying strides. I wouldn't like to commit myself to this one. The horse is involved in the photo finish. Ah, numbers one and two. Number one, Avro Anson, and number two, Balasani. It's between Mark Dwar and Mark Perrett with number seven, Minella Lad third. Well, this is a close one. Well, what do you think of that? It's close, all right. It's very close indeed. There'll be a steward's inquiry, I would think, uh, as well. Triple Witching's uh, rider, Adrian McGuire. And there is a steward's inquiry. Yep. So, isn't that typical? 
of the Swings of Fortune in racing. Adrian Maguire wins the triumph hurdle, and then he has a painful crash in the very next race. Right, well, let's have a look at this, because uh, there's no doubt there is going to be a steward's inquiry. We think it was Avro Anson who did the damage. He runs across uh, Minella Lad, and there's all sorts of scrimmaging happening. Uh, on the inside, little sweet juke. This is triple witching falling there, and it's a very heavy fall. I think what's happened there, Richard, somebody's knocked the hurdle down in front of him, and there's nothing there for him to jump, and he really hasn't come back on his hocks at all. He's just tripped up over the hurdle, and that is the nastiest fall of the lot because you're hitting the ground very, very quick. Sometimes over hurdles, when you do fall, you have a nastier fall than over fences. Anyway, we're running back to the last now, and there in front is uh, number seven, Menene Lad, and... Uh, the jockey's pulled his stick through to his uh, left hand there, just giving him a couple of rinders, but Mark Dwyer and the sheepskin noseband uh, looks to be going as well as any. And there, in behind with his Balasani and Mark Perrett, he's either been a complete genius here and got up and won, or he's uh, going to be cursed by the punters. <laughs> well, and this is the important part now. Minella Lad on the right of the picture, Avro Anson with a definite advantage here. They go to this jump, and it's shortly after it, you see Avro picks up in front, and uh, Mark Dwyer picks up his stick, gives him one, with the right hand and very shortly now as Balasani starts to come to challenge from third place there you'll see that Avro Anson hits the front and goes across left-handed Mark switches his stick very quickly but it takes Minella Lad out uh, Mark Perrett was very quick to see what was happening and switches across to the left there's no doubt that uh, I think when you see that head on it'll tell quite a story but as the post comes you can see Avro Anson's neck lead is being whittled down with every stride as they cross the line and you must remember it's an odd angle from here well it certainly looks as if Avro Anson will get the best of the photo but I doubt whether he'll get the best of the stewards inquiry Mark Dwyer wants uh, to have St Patrick in there with him to keep that I think and the prices as they stand Balasani nine to two joint favorite Avro Anson at eight to one be fascinating to see the head on and uh, we'll try and evaluate this for you again. Now, look here on the left with the sheepskin noseband of the two leaders is Avro Anson. Mark with his stick in his right hand. Balasani, lots of room between uh, him and Minella Lad. In fact, Mark was going to go up the inner. He's got his head down here and he sees the violent veering across there of Avro Anson. Mark uh, Dwyer was very quick to switch his stick and try and correct him, but he's definitely taken out the third horse, Manella Lad, who's lost his footing there. Mark Perrett very quick to see the uh, what was happening and comes up the outside. There's no doubt for me that what will happen there. Mark Perrett was uh, Mark Dwyer, not Mark Perrett's Mark Perrett's on the second horse. Was very quick both times to pull his stick through, but uh, I don't think that'll save the result. I mean, he doesn't deserve any band. It wasn't his fault why the horse has gone across, but uh, I think. Uh, you know, he will lose that race, and Martin Pipe and Mark Perrett have uh, completed a great double. Well, they haven't done yet, but that is our evaluation. Avaranson, lovely big horse trainer, Morris Camacho, very good trainer indeed. It's even better when the ground gets faster than this. Um, he is a horse that has run an exceptional race here. And just down below us, uh, Balasani has gone into the second place, uh, but of course it'll all hinge on what happens. Uh, as a jockey, it's superstitious they're very often superstitious they go into the second place when you're not quite sure because you look a fool to go into the first place and come out again see mark dwyer isn't going into the first place either it's just superstition isn't it you you don't mind being promoted it's horrible to be demoted he doesn't want to tempt fate neither of them want to tempt fate although they all have their ideas of what will happen remember it'll take a little while now i'm sure the stewards have already rerun that film several times uh, they will have consulted with the steward secretary but the moment these boys go in uh, they'll be asking for an explanation when mark perry there, there's the photo finish it's impossible to say sometimes you say that this side has a has an advantage in in a photograph but i mean i've as mr david pipe used to say to me that it's in a straight line nobody's got any uh, favor i noticed the student here's the result of the photograph first number one avro answer well, that is the result of the photograph, but the action will all be happening in the stewards' room now, and uh, we're both convinced that uh, the result will change. Mark Dwyer walking in there with Colin Russell, the journalist, and he's giving his opinion of what... Morris Camacho, the trainer, just behind him. 
when they pulled up, I noticed Mark Perrett and Mark Dwyer had a word, and then Mark Perrett obviously jogged on down as quick as he could because he wanted to have a word with uh, Martin Pipe and just confirm, I suspect, that he was going to object. Yes, well, there, the price is subject to the stewards' inquiry. Abrahamson, 8-1. to one. Balassani, 9-2, joint favourite. Minella Lad, 7-1. to one. But it's all about to happen now. So, down here in the weighing room, to see Bart Owens, uh, jockey Graham Bradley. He's just going to get on the scales. And uh, then Mark Dwyer is waiting again. They're talking about it. So, half an hour before the Gold Cup and his ride on Chindami, Mark Dwyer has plenty on his mind and an imminent visit to the stewards' room because this was an incident which, uh, well, there was probably nothing that Mark could have done to prevent it, but uh, certainly you'd have to argue uh, did have an effect on the outcome of the race. And Abrahams and Duff, the last, really well. Mark Dwyer's got his whip in his right hand. That is the correct hand. Now, Mark Perrett was quite entitled to challenge on the inside of the runner-up, the, the Irish mare, that Manella lad, and makes his challenge. Now the Irish animal runs away under pressure. Mark's horse suddenly goes to the left. Mark pulls his whip through the left hand. But there has been interference there. Now, you might say that was accidental interference because Mark Dwyer had his whip in the correct hand at all times. So the next question the stewards have to answer is, did it affect the outcome of the race? Well, I think anyone watching the side-on and the head-on and realizing that this horse has only been beaten a nostril, you would have to say that that affected the outcome of the race. And so the stewards really have little or no alternative but to alter the result. That's how it looks from here, but Jonathan Powell is down in the unsaddling. Yes, yes. yes with I mean, me... I can't add anything to it because no. I haven't seen it. Yes, with me is slightly disconsolate to Maurice Camacho, the trainer and part owner of Abrahamson, and um, Brian right. Skirton, who is the other part owner. Gentlemen, a steward's inquiry, uh, we think it doesn't look very good for you at this stage. Uh, Mark didn't seem to think he'd done much wrong, but uh, I was on the hill, so I saw nothing at Bri all. Brian? I was in a bad position to watch it, but the consensus of opinion seems to be that he wants to, won't keep it. It would be tough on this horse because so many times he's been knocking on the door. He's finally got his head in front here in the race that matters most. Mark just said he just, um, you know, when he heard the crowd, he, and when the other horse came to him, he ran again, you know. He'd look to be sort of stopping halfway up the hill, but uh, we've wanted the ground for him all year and we've never had it. But, I mean, if you have a jumper and... Uh, you're waiting for top of the ground, you're lucky, aren't you? And yes. we've really been lucky to get ground that we've got, to be honest, with the winter we've had, we've no complaints. He's run a marvellous race, whatever happens. And Morris, if you lose it here, would you go to Liverpool for the two-mile no. five hurdle? No, highly unlikely. Um, if he keeps it, uh, the owner won't be happy, but uh, he'll probably retire for the season. Uh, he says I don't run him often enough as it is. <laughs> and uh, otherwise he'd go to the Ascot race, the Leatherby and Christopher. No, he'd go to the Ascot sales, actually. <laughs> well, tense moments so, for you, yeah. gentlemen. Let's hope it works out in your favour. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you. They're betting four to one on in the ring, Balassani, to get the race. The jackpot news is that there is a pool of £657,556. £657,556. 56,000 pounds uh, in the tote jackpot. And the place pot, 271,000 pounds. So the stewards have a great burden of responsibility here. The going, they say, it's dried up, perfect good ground. And now the starting prices objection, as they pass the post. An objection has been lodged. First, number one, Avro Anson, eight to one. Second, number two, Balassani, a 92 joint favourite. And third, number seven, Manila Lad, seven to one. Remember, there is a steward's inquiry. And there's also an objection. The uh, Hexham result, 235. They went to number two, Scarver, seven to two. A second, number eight, Volunteer Point, three to one favourite. And uh, third, number one, Carl Buckmore, 130. And at Lingfield, the 240 there, first number nine, Carla, six to one. Second number eight, Lady Roxanne, six to one also. And third number seven, Lift Boy, also six to one. Confirmation that an objection has been lodged by the rider of the runner-up.
to the winner. And so in a few moments we move on towards the highlight of the meeting, the Tote Cheltenham Gold Cup. Some great names are inscribed in the Roll of Honour and some of them are at Cheltenham today. And who could fail to recognise this great hero of that emotional race in 1989? The great Desi looking as perky as ever. Little Owl, the horse who gave his owner, amateur rider Jim Wilson, such a famous ride back in 1981. There's a pub named after him in Cheltenham. Brigorn's travelled over from Ireland today, the horse who led that fabulous 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 charge for Michael Dickinson in 1983. And Charter Party, a local hero. He won it in 1988 for David Nicholson, Richard Dunwoody, and the local owners, Jenny Mould and Claire Smith. And Norton's coin. There's never been such a shock in the Gold Cup, and there's never been a day like it in the life of his owner trainer, Cyril Griffiths. It's got an orchid on the near side, Toby DeBias on the far side, Desi Glance, a neck in front, Tennis Spades has fallen there, racing to the final fence now, Desert Orchid is under pressure, Toby DeBias on the far side, Norton's coin between horses, over the last, Toby DeBias and Norton's coin, it's Norton's coin in the centre, Toby DeBias over on the far side, Desert Orchid's back in third place and he's beat, it's Toby DeBias and Norton's coin, it's a race towards the line, Norton's coin is going to win it at the line, Norton's coin is one of Toby DeBars in second, third is Toby Norgate. Good cup winners. Thank you, Cyril, it's really lovely to see these old horses again and Norton's coin looking very well. What is his routine these days? His routine, <laughs> his routine is uh, getting up in the morning, having his breakfast and going out in the field. Stop in there for several hours unless it's very wet and coming back in again. He, he hasn't been ridden since he ran at Newbury early February of last year. You haven't been tempted to run him again? I can't, because he keeps coughing all the time. So it's just impossible. I just wish someone could come along and give me some medicine to stop him coughing. And does that then prevent you from perhaps riding him off for a hack round the hills or going hunting on him? Well, well I, I, one could ride him round the hills if he wanted to, but you feel that the way he coughs, it, it wouldn't be fair on him, you know, especially what he's, the pleasure he's given us. It just seemed to me it wouldn't be fair. If he, if he didn't cough, yes, then of course I would start riding him. The day that he won the Gold Cup will go down as one of the most memorable ever at Cheltenham. What do you remember best about it, Cyril? The few minutes I remember best of, of uh, Jonathan was when the horses went out to the paddock. I thought, how am I going to get out into the enclosure to watch this race? So I followed him down the path out onto the course, knowing there was a gate on the corner to come back into the members' enclosure. But when I got there, I couldn't find the gate because the crowd was so thick. But when I did find the crowd, uh, when I did find uh, the gates through the crowd, um, I happened to look up the course and see this mass of people. And what went through my mind was, what the hell am I doing here with a horse in this race in front of all these people? And that's what I should remember most of all, more than a horse winning. It was a truly great day. It's lovely to see you and him again. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Cyril Griffiths and Cheltenham gives people memories that last a lifetime and Norton's coin was certainly one of those great emotional days. Well now good news, Adrian Maguire who had that crashing fall in the last race on triple witching, he's got up, walked away and he is fit to ride Mini Homer in the Tote Cheltenham Gold Cup. The first prize well in excess of £100,000, only 15 runners now because Ride Again is a non-runner. Let's check on them with Peter O'Sullivan. Number one is Blazing Walker, written by Chris Grant, one of uh, several of them engaged in the Martell Grand National. Two is the seven-time course winner, Bradbury Star, written by Declan Murphy. Three, Capability Brown, engaged in the National, Mick Fitzgerald. Four, course winner Chatham, who's engaged in the National, written by Graham McCourt. Five, Deep Bramble for Ireland, written by Peter Niffin. Six, Docklands Express, the senior runner at 12 years of age, ridden by Dean Gallagher. Seven, Flashing Steel for Ireland, a course winner, ridden by Jamie Osborne. Eight is Garrison Savannah, engaged in the national, a three-time course winner, including, of course, the 91 Tote Cheltenham Gold Cup, Graham Bradley. Nine, Joe Darmy, last year's winner 
of the Tote Cheltenham Gold Cup, ridden by Mark Dwyer. Ten, Mini Homer, engaged in the national course winner, ridden by Adrian McGuire. Eleven, Run for Free, engaged in the national, a dual course winner and a winner of the Coral Welsh National and the Stackett Scottish National, ridden by Mark Perrett. Thirteen is the fellow for France, twice beaten a short head in the Tote Cheltenham Gold Cup, engaged in the national, ridden by Adam Condrat. Fourteen is Topsham Bay, engaged in the national, a four times course winner, ridden by Jimmy Frost. Fifteen, Young Hustler, engaged in the national, a dual course winner, are ridden by Carl Llewellyn. And finally, sixteen, also for Ireland, the mayor, Ebony Jane, engaged in the Martel Grand National, and ridden by the Ritz Club Charity Trophy current leader, Charlie Swan. Here's how they better the man. And here's the betting for the Tote Cheltenham Gold Cup, our first show, 5-4 to four, Jodami, 5-1 to one, The Fellow, 11-2 to two, Bradbury Star, 10-1 to one, Flashing Steel, Mini Homer and Run for Free, 12-1 to one, Docklands Express, 14-1 to one, Garrison Savannah, 16-1 to one, Deep Bramble, 20-1 to one, Blazing Walker and Young Hustler, 25-1 to one, Chatham, 66-1 to one, Topham, Topham Bay and Ebony Jane, and the outsider of the 15 runners, Capability Brown, at 100 to 1. No news of the stewards' inquiry, but the stage set for the blue ribbon of steeplechasing, the Tote Gold Cup. Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, in the paddock with Brigadier Andrew Parker Bowles there. And she's always been uh, a lucky token for the Conducted Stable, or now the Jack Dawes Castle Stable of David Nicholson, who got one in the bank already today, and Her Royal Highness, a great steeplechasing fan. Great expectation for the arrival of the favourite, but of course the, a slight delay because Mark Dwyer had to weigh out before he went into the steward's room to give evidence before the stewards, having weighed out the painstaking business of saddling Jadami by Peter Bowman, assisted by his daughter, Anthea Farrell, before, of course, he can move into the parade range. But the second favorite, he's in the paddock, Bradbury star, Josh Gifford, came so close to winning yesterday's champion chase with deep sensation. Can he go one better with this horse? He loves the course, Bradbury Star, and when he won the Maxson Gold Cup under a semi-concussed Declan Murphy, it was his seventh course win. Peter, horses for courses, is that going to work here? <laughs> he was always run well round here. He was second in the Sun Alliance to uh, Mini Homer as well as that great victory. Um, Josh Gifford is a far better trainer than uh, I'll ever believe or, or think I'll ever be, but I just wonder sometimes when, uh, whether he, a pair of blinkers would just help him up the hill, just stop him pricking those ears, but... Uh, you know, they know best, uh, but some, some trainers just don't like putting blinkers on him, but he always strikes me as a horse that uh, perhaps would uh, run a little better in them. Well, he doesn't find a lot from the last, but uh, one horse who does is the holder of the title, Jadami, this season. There have been a couple of hiccups along the way, but everything fell into shape when he went to Leopardstown last month for his second Hennessy Cognac Irish Gold Cup. As they come down now towards the second last, Jodami from Flashing Steel. Jodami, Mark Dwyer, sitting there uh, quite confidently with Flashing Steel alongside. At the second last, Jodami and Flashing Steel together. Flashing Steel's a faller. Flashing Steel's on the floor. And racing now towards the straight, Jodami's left clear in the uh, Hennessy Cognac Gold Cup. A long way clear of Chatham and 4-7. Deep Bramble struggling. Carmel how a long way behind. And racing now towards the uh, final fence. It's Jadami, last year's winner with a commanding lead. 4-7 coming to uh, tackle Chatham for the second spot. And they're followed in fourth by Deep Bramble, who's staying on. As they come to the last, Jadami, the favourite, jumps it uh, slightly sideways, but uh, a long way clear. Deep Bramble's going to land second, 4-7, third. And fourth place is Chatham. Carville Howe back in last position, but racing up to the line. Jadami's going to complete the double wins the uh, Hennessy Cognac Gold Cup for the second consecutive year. Jadami, 
coming home, a long way clear. Deep Bramble staying on gamely in second, but uh, Jadami's going to win it by uh, 10, 12 lengths or so. Very, very soft ground at Leopardstown that day. Tommy, was Flashing Steel a serious threat when he fell? Well, I, he looked to me as if he was beat at the time. A lot of, a lot of people thought he was going reasonably well, but uh, watching, re watching that again, he definitely wasn't going nowhere near as well as Jadami. And that was a great performance from Jadami. He galloped away. He got there sooner than he'd want to be. He left on his own. It was a great performance. I think he's as good as he, he was last year, coming to the same, at the same stage. And uh, I think there's nothing to beat him. The main danger for me is Bradbury Star. And here comes the outcome of the stewards' inquiry on the second place. The placings are revised. Balasani is now the winner. Avro Anson is second. And the Irish challenger Minella Ladd remains third. So the first and second are reversed. Balasani is now the winner of the bonus print stairs hurdle. Avro Anson second and Minella Ladd third. So, there'll be plenty of players still in the tote jackpot pool, a pool of £657,000 going into the Gold Cup, and so many of those combinations will be on this horse, the 1993 Gold Cup winner, Giordano. Let's now join Richard Pittman and Peter Scudamore from the past. This horse is what we all look for when we say a typical chaser skew. Although Gold Cup winners we've seen in all shapes and sizes. Little Bragorn, good to see him back. You know, not very big at all. Same with Silver Buck. But this is the sort of horse we all think of as a Gold Cup horse. Yeah, magnificent horse. People talk about, I, I've been reading the papers, or oh, this is the last of the dying breed and the, 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 this is the great big giant of a horse. Yes, he's a big horse, but he's not a giant of a horse. He's a perfect athlete. He's springy when he jumps. Some of those big horses are are too big and are not great athletes. This is an athlete. Doesn't he look well? Yes, he's very well in himself. Well done to Peter Beaumont and his daughter Anthea for bringing him here in this condition. He's 11 to 8 favourite from 5 to 4. I saw Peter Bowman on the way out last night and he's a quiet man but he was quiet and pale <laughs> last night. He's a, he's a real gentleman. Um, Mark Dwyer, will that have affected his confidence, the uh, stewards inquiry? Well, Pete, it's a long time since I've ridden but I would say not in the slightest. This is, will be a new job, an exciting thing to do. That last race is forgotten for Dwyer. It's onwards and upwards. Well, we hope not upwards too much. <laughs> <laughs> onwards and forwards. There we have uh, the French challenger, the fellow, ridden by Adam Conrad. He uh, stayed with me last night, so I got him off to bed early. He, uh, and uh, So there's no excuses in that. Uh... Well, Skew, a lot of people have been hounding him, haven't they, in the press, uh, oh, Adam Conrad? Very unfairly. Uh, you, you go to France and watch those French jockeys ride. They're slightly smaller than us because they do... Uh, the, us, I'm talking about the English jump riders because they do a, a, a lighter weight. And he, for, for that, you look at Adrian Maguire, you can wrap up smaller and stylishly. He's a very, very talented rider. And he doesn't use his stick a lot because the uh, owner, Mar the uh, Markella de... Moratala. Moratala, that was the word I was looking for, Richard. She, uh, she doesn't like the horse to be hit more than two two or three times. Adam said to me that uh, she's, he's allowed to hit him three times if he wins, but not if he gets beat. Well, he looks exceptionally well, as horses do, of course, in the sun. Here, leading them out. That looks like Colin Brown on board, is it? He's always Colin, crying. yes, yeah. On does he? Yeah, Colin never actually uh, rode him to victory in the uh, Gold Cup, but... Uh, he, uh, I remember watching him ride him over fences the first time he ever ran at Devon, and we all rushed to the television screen to laugh because nobody wanted to, <laughs> nobody would want to ride him because he was very quick over hurdles and uh, proved this all wrong. But it's interesting you're looking at the Jadami and what is the perfect shape for a chaser? All these horses are different shapes and sizes. I remember Graham Thorner riding this desert orchid on the on the track at Kempton. He said he gave a great feel even now, you know, <laughs> marvelous feel. So here are all the chaps. There's little Brigorn at the chestnut with those ears always pointed forwards. Charter party and Norton's coin. Bringing him up, looking happy. So back to the action. Who out of this lot will join that group as a former winner? There's Bradbury Star. He's being just overtaken there by Chatham in the blue colours, Graham McCourt on board. But Bradbury is a lovely horse. I, I just said uh, to one of my companions here earlier, what an athlete did he walk round, a, a bit like my Sylve. 
you can't see him now because of the crowds, but when he was relaxed, everything again was loose skew. You know, he was using every part of it. It's a lovely thing to... I think evaluating a horse at the walk is an important thing. Yes, I think, you know, we, we talk about it all the time. I mean, these, these horses, we, we talk about human athletes and athlete, athlete, uh, equine athletes. These are equine athletes. And you see uh, Linford Christie or one of the West Indian fast bowlers or Sebco walk, they're loose and they can walk properly. And uh, that's when you're looking to buy a horse, that's what you look for. If they can, usually, if they can walk well, they gallop well. Well, he disappointed last time and he was wrong. You must ignore his last run. You must look back to previous form. And remember, Bradbury Star has beaten Jadami at Liverpool two seasons ago over three miles one. He has, and he was only just touched off in the uh, Gold Cup by Barton Bank. And many feel that Barton Bank would have beaten Jadami the first time they met at Weatherby earlier in the season. Mini Homer. Well, you know this one better than most, Skew. But uh, if his win last time out surprised Martin Pipe, there must have been improvement, and that gives him a squeak here. This horse is as good as any. He proved that when he beat, Sun Alliance, uh, beat Bradbury Star in the Sun Alliance. Now they're starting to lead out. Tim Unwin on the left, master, long, long time... Uh, uh, long time master of the Cotswold Tim on the left there and a great man for country sports. So Blazing Walker in the yellow colours, first to lead him out, Peter Cheeseborough. And this one will go on to the Aintree National. Peter Cheeseborough trains Chris Grant, who had a nasty smash recently back on board. It certainly altered the shape of his face, uh, this, his recent fall. He looks quite fat in the face now, he's always been lean. After him, little Bradbury star. Then Capability Brown. Well, Mick Fitzgerald's got a a job on here, a very quick jumper, this horse. Followed by Chatham, Graham McCourt. After him, we've got oh, the orange of Deep Bramble, Michael Hurrigans, Peter Niven is in the plate. Then Little Docklands Express by Roscoe Blake, back at the Emerald Stud now, having been to Italy. Dean Gallagher rides. Flashing Steel from Ireland, the second of the Irish runners, trained by, uh, by uh, John Mulhern for Charles Hawkey. Osborne rides. Garrison Savannah, well, He's, uh, he's done the business here and been uh, so close in the national. Brad on board. Jadami next to Mark Dwyer. Pensive, as you'd expect. Then we've got Mini Homer in the star, followed by uh, Run for Free. Then The Fellow, the light colours of Topshin. Young Hustler in the blue and yellow. And finally, Ebony Jane, the mayor at the back. Now back out on this green sword we have got blazing walker only one run a win 25 from 20s a lovely horse who's had his training problems followed by bradbury star just look at the way this horse walks five to one from 11 to two the roof will be lifted if josh wins with this fellow then little capability brown from the pipe stable pulled up on his only run um, he's got a lot to do chatham class horse chatham and uh, he's only had two runs this season. Again, been suffering from a few problems, but Martin likes him, 33s from 25s. Deep Bramble by Deep Run from Michael Hurrigan's yard. This one brought down a couple of runs ago, but he's a very courageous horse. But he's 20s from 16s on the drift. Docklands Express, he loves it here at Cheltenham. He runs up the hill as if the, the devil himself's behind him. 14s from 12s, the ground's coming for this one. Flashing steel, well, how do we judge that fall? How much would he have challenged Jadami? We'll see today. Ten to one, Oz is on board. Garrison Savannah, perhaps more a Martel national horse than uh, the Cheltenham Gold Cup. He came so very, very close to doing that great double. 50 to one from 40s, but uh, he looks well. Jadami, he's calm and collected. So is Dwyer. They've done all their homework. Now it's the show. Mini Homer, not very big. A horse who can stand off or go in close. He won't want to hit the front too soon. Very game. Maguire, back on board after that nasty fall, following a big win earlier on. Run for free. Funny horse, comes up this hill well, hangs left and right. Hope he goes straight today. Mark Perrett. 13 is the fellow, right again, a non-runner, of course, the fellow from France, Francois Dumas, the trainer. He's been so close on two occasions. Can he do it today? 
14 is Topsham Bay, big horse, the ground coming for him all the time, unseated and pulled up his last two. I'd just be slightly surprised if he's good enough. 101 from 66s. Young Hustler, small, game, a winner at the festival last season, hasn't fired yet, but Twiston Davises have done well at this meeting. 20s from 25s. Ebony Jane is the mayor. She won the Irish National. She's by Roselia, Francis Flood trained, and Charlie Swan, 66 to 1 shot the mayor here, and also another one entered for the Martel National. Not a big mayor. She goes well and will go in softer ground than this, but has won on decent ground. So that is the complete field. Remember, 15 face the starter because right again is a non-runner. There a view from the grandstand and a lot of people down below who will only see the head of the person in front <laughs> of them. But they're here. Now Jadami is 11 to 8. 5 to 1 Bradbury star, more support there. The fellow on the drift still to 7s. 10s flashing steel, mini homer and run for free. 14s from 12, Docklands Express. 20s from 16s, Deep Bramble. 20s in from 25, Blazing Walker. That would be a popular win. And 20s, the same price, Young Hustler. It's 33 to 1 after that. Talking about the huge crowd and those people only seen the back of their heads, there's people around the paddock already waiting to uh, see the winner coming in. So <laughs> it just shows you the size of the crowds there. Why there they incredible. cantering down to start. The nerves will be beginning to relax a little bit now. You're out in the open air. I'm nervous. I don't know about you, Richard. It, uh, I can feel the tension of the, and the atmosphere of the whole meeting. It's uh, amazing how a big race like this, even though you're not riding in, it gets to you. Well, when I rode in, it's on odds on favourites. I rode like John McCrick. You'd expect him to ride. But down in the ring, it is our own Victor Stallone. It's Rocky in the ring. And Jadami is still a hot favourite down here at 11 to 8. 11,000 to 8 laid in several places. The best-backed horse on the course here will be Bradbury Star, 6 to 1 into 5 to 1. Flashing Steels, the, the strongest of the outsiders, the Irish horse, 14 to 1 into 10 to 1, 14 to 1 laid to a thousand pounds several times to the Irishman but Jadami is six to four in places but still a hot favorite for our gold cup and there Desert Orchid uh, countering down still pulling Colin Ar Brown's arms out it's like you and Richard I Richard he, he's getting a bit old but he still thinks he can do it isn't it great to uh, to be reunited with these old horses that you you've uh, ridden to victories and Colin of course started him off the horse looks incredibly well but I have seen him in a few parades where he hasn't actually wanted to go down to the start <laughs> very much on his toes look he's almost doing an extended trot there and Colin Brown well keeps the pub he's got a very good restaurant called the Ibex and he's supported by a lot of racing folk all reliving old memories so he's done his bit, Colin safe and sound. Which of this lot is going to join him on that roll of honour? Well, there on the left of the picture, coming towards us, is flashing steel from Ireland. Would he have beaten Jadami Skew? He looked very tired to me. The reason he fell, you could see him going to that second last. His stride was beginning to shorten, and uh, th that's very often a sign that they're tired and also when Jadami jumped that second last his stride lengthened you could see Mark Dwyer was worried about being left in front too long and away he strided to the last uh, interesting uh, the booking here Jamie Osborne he's never ridden this horse in public he's been over to Ireland and schooled him this horse is uh, usually ridden by Richard Dunwoody Richard's done a lot of schooling on him at home I've watched him ever since he was a novice over hurdles very clumsy over hurdles uh, but Richard as I say has done a lot of schooling on him and Richard always you see him and he's got that style he lays up the neck of horses and dares horses to come up with him and now Jamie Osborne does a similar type of thing so I think he'll suit the horse but he is a clumsy jumper at times he's by broadsword a horse I used to ride I was second in the triumph hurdle on him Right, well, let's have a look at uh, Run for Free now. This horse, of course, he pulled up lame last time he ran. Uh, he wouldn't be here unless he was cherry ripe, of course. He'd been back to Mary Bromley's to be tweaked and twitched. And he has that incredible bit, the sliding bit that goes through to try and keep him straight. 
It doesn't always do so, but Martin Pipe has told me, well, uh, any ordinary bit would be even worse. But this horse does like Cheltenham. He put the most extraordinary performance up at the end of last season when he went in the Scottish National. He got left at four, nearly a fence, and he still got up and won. He's finished in front of Jadami at Haydock uh, this time, albeit getting a, a fair bit of weight, getting £10 off him. But uh, he's beaten Jadami round Haydock before, and I think he's capable of giving Jadami a big race if he's got over his injury, which obviously ha they hope he has, as he wouldn't be here. And down in the ring, there's further movement. And down here in the ring is where it's all happening. And one bookmaker with me here, Pat Whelan from Liverpool. 13 to 8, Jadami. This favourite is weakening. The bookmakers down here want to lay Jadami. He's been easing out from 5 to 4. And now 13 to 8 in one or two places. That's the story down here in the ring. I would think that most of the serious spondoolies are on already now. I think it's uh, only people trying to balance their books at this stage. Nearest to us is 14 Topsham Bay. Garrison Savannah trotting through. It's nearly upon us. Peter O'Sullivan, the man for the moment. The 67th tote goal yeah, cup. Take a turn, those that want to. We've got one stuck sideways onto the tape here. Very nearly so underway. Run for free. Back to the tape at the moment. Docklands Express right over on the inside. This is Blazing Walker. He's got very warm. Young hustlers rather close to the tape. Blazing Walker still turning. Pull them back a bit, Father. Don't be ridiculous. You've still got your head out. Just pull it out. Pull it back. Not walking, sir. I'm planting. Oh, come on, sir. <laughs> yeah. We've got one facing the wrong way. Yeah, don't stay planted, sir. Come on! It's away, and that's it. Young Hustler and Docklands Express and run for free. Ebony Jane, as they come to the first. Capability Brown wide towards the left with the fellow upsides him and over the first. And all safely over it, Blazing Walker actually jumped at last. Garrison Savannah's gone up to join the lead with Topsham Bay and Capability Brown on the near side, run for free on the far side, and Young Hustler right up with them and all safely over the second, and Young Hustler taking him along now from run for free and Topsham Bay and Docklands Express, and then comes Benny Homer and Garrison Savannah and Capability Brown, then Ebony Jane and Flashing Steel and Jadami and the fellow, and behind the fellow is Deep Bramble. And then comes Chatham. Behind Chatham is Bradbury Star and Blazing Walker, just the back marker, as they run down to another plain fence before the water. The third. Run for free on the inside. Young Hustler, Topsham Bay towards the outside. Running down now to the water. Number four. 14 on the next circuit it'll be. Run for free. Young Hustler and Topsham Bay. Docklands Express in behind them, then the fellow and Jodami and Minnie Homer. First of the ditches here, run for free, lands in the lead from Young Hustler. Then Topsham Bay on the outside of Docklands Express on the inner, Mini Homer next, Jodami, and on the outside, the fellow as they jump the sixth. Run for free, the leader from Young Hustler and Topsham Bay. Mini Homer comes next. Then Docklands Express, Jodami and the fellow as they come to the second of the ditches and run for free lands in the lead from Young Hustler. Garrison Savannah jumped it last and it's run for free from Young Hustler as they come to the eighth. Topsham Bay, Mini Homer. Then Jodami and the fellow upsides. Docklands Express comes next, then Flashing Steel. Behind Flashing Steel is Ebony Jane. And Garrison Savannah, the back marker, he's about eight or ten lengths uh, behind the penultimate horse at the moment. They come to this fence at the top of the hill, number nine, and run for free lands in the lead from Young Hustler. Run for free, Young Hustler, Topsham Bay over on the far side. On the near side, it's uh, Mini Homer. Then the fellow and Jodami as they come to the tenth. Run for free. And Young Hustler, Topsham Bay, The Fellow, Mini Homer, and Jodami, Deep Bramble.
comes next. Then Docklands Express running smoothly on the inside. Still run for free from Young Hustler, Topsham Bay and Minnehoma Docklands Express. And the fellow as they come to the 11th. Run for free, Young Hustler. Topsham Bay, Mini Homer, Docklands Express, The Fellow and Ebony Jane and Flashing Steel and Joe Darmy and Deep Bramble. Over the 12th, run for free from Young Hustler. Mini Homer next, Topsham Bay, then The Fellow, then Docklands Express and Joe Darmy travelling well with Ebony Jane just behind him, then Flashing Steel and Deep Bramble and then comes Bradbury Star getting a little bit closer and then Chatham and Blazing Walker. Run for free as they come to the next. All still standing in the Gold Cup with 10 left to jump and run for free, leading Young Hustler, Mini Homer, then Topsham Bay, the fellow Docklands Express and Jadami towards the outside at the 13th. Run for free, Young Hustler. Mistake by Ebony Jane there. Reminders for Mini Homer as they come down to the water. Number 14, run for free, the leader from Young Hustler, Topsham Bay, the fellow. Docklands Express on the inside, then Mini Homer, Jodami towards the outer. Then Deep Bramble, the third of the ditches. Run for free from the fellow on the outside of Young Hustler. Then Topsham Bay, then Docklands Express, then Mini Homer, and then Jodami over the 16th. And over that one, it was run for free, got past there. He ducked in to the rail there, and he was passed and overtaken by uh, Young Hustler. But he's gone back into second with a close third. The fellow, as they come to the final ditch, Young Hustler from... Run for free and the fellow, Jadami, the favourite, has moved into fourth. Five then is Topsham Bay. Six is Docklands Express. Seven, Mini Homer. Eight, Deep Bramble. Then comes Flashing Steel. Five from home. And there it was Young Hustler. Young Hustler from the fellow, then run for free. Joe Darmy going up now to join the lead as Young Hustler leads the fellow down the hill towards the next fence, four from home. Young Hustler. Young Hustler from the fellow at the fourth from home. The fellow on the outside, Young Hustler on the near side, Jodami still going well in third as they come down now towards the third last and Flashing Steel still well in contention. Young Hustler, the fellow and Jodami as they come to it. Young Hustler and the fellow together, then Jodami. And here comes Bradbury Star with a powerful run too. They've got two fences left to jump in the 1994 Tote Cheltenham Gold Cup and it's still a wide open race. Young Hustler is the leader from the fellow and Jodami and Bradbury Star as they race round into the second last fence. Young Hustler on the far side, the fellow for France, Jodami in third as they come to the second last. Young Hustler and the fellow from Jodami. It's the fellow in the centre, Young Hustler on the far side. Here comes Jodami to deliver his challenge, coming to the final fence now. The fellow with a fractional advantage as they come to it. The fellow lands fractionally in the lead from Jodami and Young Hustler. Racing into the closing stages, it's the fellow from Jodami. The fellow for France on the far side, Jodami on the near side. The fellow who's been beaten a short head twice is going to hang on and win it. The fellow's money, Jodami is second, Young Hustler's third. Flashing Steel is four, and that's the one, two, three, four in the 1994 Cheltenham Gold Cup. Yeah, the fellow has won it, finally. And a victory salute from Adam Conrad, who's ridden a magnificently cool race. He is congratulated by Mark Dwar, the fellow beaten a short head twice, fourth last year, his fourth attempt, and so the result. First, number 13, the fellow, owned by the Marquesa de Moratala, trained by Francois Duimen and ridden by Adam Conrad. Second was number nine, Jonami, owned by Mr. Jane Yeadon, trained by Peter Beaumont and ridden by Mark Dwyer. Third was number 15, Young Hustler, owned by Mr. Gavin McCacken, trained by Nigel Twiston Davis and ridden by Carl Llewellyn. Fourth was number seven, Flashing Steel. And this is the winner, the fellow. 
So often the bridesmaid. But this afternoon at 7 to 1, the hero of the blue ribbon of steeplechasing. There was only one faller, and it was the mare, Ebony Jane. She'd been jumping well, but did make a mistake uh, a little way before. This about three fences before. You'll see her just creeping into the picture on the right of the picture. She's not in it yet. Just see her jockey's sleeve. It's Charlie Swan up front. Young Hustler jumping brilliantly. They look at the rails. Now she's jumping, and I'm afraid a proper unseated rider, but uh, one where you are ejected. You've got no chance when they drop their hind legs in the uh, back of the hurdle, the back of the ditch. There's only one way you can go. And there is Adam Conrad. Oh, I'm so pleased for him. He's had a lot of criticism, unjustified from ignorant people, and look what he's done. Yes. He, well, first of all, we do remember we had him a moment ago. Francois, we have he's coming to greet the fellow, but maybe just say congratulations. He's a great horse. He deserved it more than anybody else. And uh, you know, I mean, thank you. To have been here four years in a row was already something, but to win it today, it gives me a big reward. I'm very happy. Thank and you. You're always eager to come back. <laughs> there is uh, Adam. He's uh, been punching the air with delight, and uh, nobody's deserved it more. Very, very good jockey and a marvellous horse. The blinkers have been removed now. Very often they, they take the blinkers off for horse when he's come back in. There he is, waving to all the crowd. Uh, must be a great feeling for him, Richard. Yes, indeed. He went off at 7-1. to one. Jadami was second, the 6-4 to four favourite. Young Hustler running a marvellous race in defeat at 20-1. to one. What a brave little horse he is. Well, the story of the race uh, was slightly altered at the by the mistake of Jadami at the last, but in the end, it didn't cost him the race because uh, uh, although the fellow was left in front and given an advantage there, he not only maintained it, uh, he, he held on to it very well indeed. But Jadami has run a super race, and oh, second is a long way away from the winner's spot. But nevertheless, who could deny this winner, having been beaten short head on two previous occasions? Adam Kondrat, who's actually Polish-born, uh, but uh, very much part of the French scene. Francois Duman, always been a great supporter of his, and uh, I'm pleased that he's come with him. What a great race, horse race there. All, so many horses in with a chance as they turn and straighten up here. Young Hustlers run his heart out, very proud of him. There, the fellow cantering with Jadami. Uh, you, really, your money would be on Jadami here. Bradbury Star came there going very well. In the back there, Docklands Express with the yellow cap you know, to run another great race. And there they come up together. What a superb display of steeplechasing. But here, the, the, the turn of foot of uh, the fellow and the Jadami were always going to count. And here we see the slightly contrasting styles of jockey. The French jockeys tend to sit a little bit stiller. There he comes up, the fellow. Look how he hardly gets back at all, Adam Conrad. Doesn't really... Uh, pick up his stick too early, just keeps shaking his reins at him, now he goes for his stick, just waves it at him, go on old man, he's saying, keep going, it's probably something in French, allez, allez, I suspect <laughs> he's saying, and he's giving him a smack there, Mark must have thought he was in with a chance of getting back up there and chasing, chasing him up there, but uh, he's not to be, and a great victory, as Francois Dumas said, and in a minute we'll see that famous victory salute from uh, another winning jockey. Yes, but here, as they come in, it's Peter O'Sullivan who's very close to this horse and connections. Yes, what a shame uh, his owner couldn't make the journey today, but uh, she'll be delighted with this fellow because he's really won quite cleverly in the end by a length and a half under a brilliant ride from uh, young Adam. Francois, they are not in the least bit dismayed when... Uh, he found he was uh, number 13 uh, saddle cloth because he rode his last winner as, a, as an amateur on uh, a number 13 and he's uh, carried number 13 quite often when he's won ski races, a very uh, proficient uh, exponent on the slopes and uh, that was Elizabeth uh, Dumain, the, the blonde, uh, there yeah. kissing the hero of the day. Adam's girlfriend in the
tall, tall girl there to the right. A great tribute to Francois Dumain, his loyalty to uh, Conrad, whose father came over from uh, Poland to Lille, uh, an engineer, to get a job, and decided if he got a job to, uh, to bring the rest of the family. Adam, uh, when they presented himself, he was uh, small enough to be a jockey, presented himself at uh, Dumain's for a trial, and uh, Francois Dumain uh, has nurtured him ever since. Showed uh, in the finish, obeying uh, his owner's instructions. No, she'd never once a horse hit more than three times, that it was quite unnecessary that he rode. He was able to ride this horse out with hands and heels. The whip would have made no difference whatsoever, as it so seldom does. That's his... It's got him off the 13 mark, as a matter of fact, the fellow as well. He, he was winner, he went to post, the winner of 13 of his 42 races, 11 of them, no less, at uh, Ote, and two, of course, at Kempton, where he's a dual winner of the King George VI chase. Seven to one winner here, the full starting prices. First, number 13, the fellow, seven to one. Second, number nine, Jodami, six to four favorite. And third, number 15, Young Hustler, 20 to 1. And the 250 at Cheltenham. Remember, there was a steward's inquiry, and uh, Valasani, second past the post, was awarded first place. Number two, Valasani, first 9 to 2 joint favourite. Second, number one, Avro Anson, 8 to 1. And third, number seven, Manila Ladd, 7 to 1. Hexham 315, first Duchess of Tubber, 8 to 1, second the Pod's Revenge, 6 to 1, and third Norick, 8 to 1. And the 310 at Lingfield, first uh, Prince Danzig, 3 to 1, second Surprise Guest, 9 to 4, and third Dancing Clown, 6 to 1, 5 ran. Well, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. It was the fellow's fourth attempt at the Gold Cup. Finally, a victorious one, a famous win for what was the first ever French-trained winner of the Gold Cup. More news and views shortly, but for now, it's goodbye on BBC One. From Copenhagen to Lillehammer, as you've never seen them before, Torvald and... Cheltenham, where the nine-year-old, the fellows, just won a marvellous race for the Gold Cup for France and a wonderful triumph for his Polish-born jockey, Adam Contra, in the unsaddling enclosure. He was accorded a wonderful welcome by the sporting Cheltenham crowd and uh, one or two of his critics in the past, uh, one in particular who manifested himself in the unsaddling enclosure, I'm afraid, uh, uh, received the acerbity of the crowd because uh, uh, this was an ultimate justification of Adam Conrad's skill in the saddle. He rode a copybook race today. It was a wonderful race. Peter O'Sullivan describes the closing stages. They've got two fences left to jump in the 1994 Tote Cheltenham Gold Cup and it's still a wide open race. Young Hustler is the leader from the fellow and Jodami and Bradbury Star as they race round into the second last fence. Young Hustler on the far side, the fellow for France, Jodami in third as they come to the second last. Young Hustler and the fellow from Jodami. It's the fellow in the centre, Young Hustler on the far side. Here comes Jodami to deliver his challenge, coming to the final fence now. The fellow with a fractional advantage as they come to him. The fellow lands fractionally in the lead from Jodami and Young Hustler. Racing into the closing stages, it's the fellow from Jodami. The fellow for France on the far side, Jodami on the near side. The fellow who's been beaten a short hit twice is going to hang on and win it. The fellow's money, Jodami is second, Young Hustler's third. Flashing Steel is four, and that's the one, two, three, four in the 1994 Cheltenham Gold Cup. A great race, the winner number 13, the fellow, 7-1. to one. 
Second, the holder of the title, number nine, Jadami, six to four. Third, number 15, Young Hustler at 20 to one. An on-runner was right again. In the unsaddling enclosure, the presentation is about to be made. Richard Pitman's done. Yes, and in the absence of the owner, the Marchesa de Moritalia, uh, it is going to be the trainer, Francois Dumain, who receives this small but very prestigious cup. It's solid gold, a new one every year, and he receives it from Lady White, Wyatt, wife of Woodrow Wyatt, of course, chairman of the tote. Francois Dumain, who's truly an international trainer, I see him over in the States for the Breeders' Cup, here for the Gold Cup, he's at Kempton Park, and himself a very accomplished sportsman in many areas. Perennially suntanned here today with his wife Elizabeth, and uh, just there she is in shot now, uh, Lord Vesti on the microphone. So he also gets a memento. Oh, they don't mind denting that, do they? Gold is easily pushed out. He has got a dent there too, hasn't it? Yes. Oh no, that is. Looks as if someone's taken a bite out of it. That will be filled with the very best champagne. Now the Polish horn jockey Adam Kondrak, terribly personable fellow, rides as Skew said, more in the style of a flat jockey and not one to go for his stick at all. A cup that will go on his mantelpiece with a lot of feeling. Twice beaten the short head in this very prestigious race before and now he's got it by a length and a half this time. Lady Wyatt, who has presented this trophy to the owners and trainers and very great horses, and the fellow goes on the roll of honour at last after some great performances. So there our lineup: Elizabeth Dumas, Francois, Adam Kondrat, and Lord Wyatt just creeping into the picture with his pink bow tie. There the winning connections, the only one absent, of course, the owner herself, the Marchesa, who is a great supporter of jump racing. A wonderful climax to a great race. What a courageous race young Hustler ran. The fellow challenged at the last by Jadami. Jadami hit the last. What would have happened if Jadami had jumped the last well? It would have been desperately close. There was no more than a length and a half in it, halfway up the run-in. Jadami was pulling the winner back on the run-in, but Adam had enough resources. His horses run to the line. It's the first time his horses worn blinkers in the Gold Cup. They certainly helped him, but he was always in a perfect position in the race. The greatest moment for Adam Conrad. He's now with Jonathan Powell. Are we running? Yes. Adam, many congratulations. Thank you very much. How did the race go for you? Because you've been here before so close. Yeah, I have been beat two times. But can I have won two times? Then I have, everybody has said this horse is magnifique. But it's the races and it's up and, and it's a lot of people I ride about me and it's not good uh, race track for him and uh, I'm not good enough uh, in England either. Certainly, it's, yeah. But <laughs> today <laughs> then everybody see so can it's not all of us all of the races is the same. The races in change like the day and like the weather. Today were you always happy that the horse was going like a winner? Oh yes. Uh, Today uh, I have done the race like my boss have say and uh, and it's happened like <laughs> it's coming and after the last fence then I say the semester and I push hand and is the stick little bit and for I don't know what it happened but let's see. And this time there wasn't a challenger to catch you on the line. Uh, yeah, we I think about a lot you know for on the for on the middle of the race. But it's so difficult to, you know, explain to me English because my English is so <laughs> not easy. But we can see very much that you're a happy young man. How did this rate with your big successes in France? Oh, it's... Uh, I not really it, it, understand. I, this is a very big victory yes. for you. How does oh, it yes. compare with like, the big victories oh, in France? You don't get compared like in, in, the, in the France because can you win like Canton? I win killing just six. Then all the world talking about this horse and about this race. In France, you get the horse who have won three times the big steeplechase in France. And England, no one know who is it. And 
for me, this one, it's really, I, I'm really happy for that because all the world know who is it, the fellow. Adam, many congratulations. Thank you very much. Well done, Adam. Thank, well Thank you. Adam Conrad, what a wonderful moment for him. Well, triumph and disaster, they're two great imposters. It was no disaster for Jadami to be beaten. It was a disappointment, but to the sporting Yorkshire connections, they'll have taken it in their stride. Peter Beaumont, the trainer, spoke a moment ago to Jonathan. Yes, with me, Jadami's trainer, Peter Beaumont. Peter, he's run a great race and defeat, hasn't he? Oh, yes, going to run better. Um, you know, we were quite happy with him beforehand. He was in good condition. Uh, no, no excuses. Ran a great race. Everything else was well beaten. Um, great race. Did Mark Dwyer think he might have won if he jumped the last as well as he jumped all the other fences? Well, it's debatable, isn't it? He was beaten a length and a half, but you know it could have made. It would have been very close anyway, shall we say? And will this horse run again this season, Peter? He's entered in the whip red. We'll see. Uh, it'll either be there or, you know, nothing. And then back here next year? All being well, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll see Jadami again, that's for sure. The quality goes through to the end of the programme at Cheltenham, as does the jackpot, of course. One or two jackpots will have been dented by that result. But now the Fox Hunters, Christie Fox Hunters chase, Incredibly, only five runners, the smallest field in the history of the race, but there's double silk. Runners and riders from Peter. Yes, and it's double silk, of course, that's frightened away most of the opposition, although there are talented uh, horses against him. Number one is Arda C, a winner of six of his 48 races, ridden by Mr. James Wintle. Two is Double Silk, winner of ten of his 13 races, and ridden by, as usual, by Mr. Ron Trelogan. Three is One Stung, winner of eight of 19 races, ridden by Mr. Johnny Greenall. Four is Speaker's Corner, winner of two only of his 33 races, ridden by Mr. Michael Sarsby. But five, T. Planter, is winner of 15 of his 20 races, and ridden by Mr. Richard Russell. And a red hot favourite in the Fox Hunters, double silk, five to two on from three to one on. T Planter is seven to two, once stung is six to one, it's thirty-three to one speaker's corner, and sixty-six to one R to Z. Quite astonishing that this horse has frightened away all but four rivals. Certainly in total contrast to last year when he was faced by seventeen opponents, but there weren't many left at the end. Kerioka towards the near side, double silk between horses at the second last. Double silk and Kerioka, Kerioka towards the near side. Over on the far side, it's double silk. Kerioka and double silk now as they come into the closing stages. Kerioka on the near side, double silk on the far side. Double silk on the far side, Kerioka under pressure. It's between these two now as they race up towards the line. Double Silk is holding Kenny Orchid. Kenny Orchid challenging all the time, but Double Silk is going to win it in at the line. Double Silk is the winner, and Kenny Orchid is second. And third is one star. That's the one, two, three. Double Silk beating Kerry Orchid and one stung, one of the four that oppose him today. Well, earlier I spoke to his rider, Ron Trelogan. Ron, 18 runners last year, only five today. Does that please you or not? It doesn't really worry me or the horse, I don't think, but I feel a little bit sorry for the sponsors and for the race, really, because it is a real big race for the hunter chase people to follow, but to be a small field, it's disappointing for them. He's had things pretty easy so far this season, hasn't he? Too easy for how I would like it. I'd like to have had a, a race before we came here. Up until now, he hasn't had a serious race. Do you feel he's a better horse this year than he was last? He's a stronger horse this year. Whether he's better, time will tell today, I suppose. But he's certainly stronger, yes. Will you have the national on the back of your mind when you're riding today? No, this was one of the main targets for the year. And we'll be thinking of today only and worry about the next one after that. Well, it's a responsibility for anyone to ride a five to two on favourite at Cheltenham, let alone uh, an amateur rider. But uh, Ron seems to take Everything in his stride, Tommy, doesn't he? Yes, he's, he's very cool about the whole thing. This horse has won his last nine races. It's a lot, you know, it's a great performance. And I was talking to Dick Saunders earlier in the week and I asked him, how good is this horse? He said, if he ran the Gold Cup, you think he'd definitely finish in the first six. That was his, but I was trying to compare him with the great horse. He won the National on guitar. 
and I, he said he's equally as good as him. Well, that's certainly a real possibility. Let's join Richard and Skew. Yes, he's by Dubasov. He's uh, homebred, well, British bred, and a lovely big scoby horse, but he keeps galloping, a bit like my Silv we mentioned earlier, Skew. He'll keep galloping to the line, but he also is very adept at the fences. He can fiddle, he can come up, and he meets them right most of the time. His last run was at Warwick in a hunter chase there, obviously a hunter chase at Warwick, and I thought he put up a brilliant performance jumping. He was uh, made virtually all. He was uh, just headed maybe early on. Uh, you, you jumped the first two at Warwick, and you got up a hill and then down the hill. You got a long row of fences along the back, the five in a row there, and it was an exhibition of quick, economical jumping. You don't always have to stand off a long way from a fence to be quick and accurate over them, and he... Um, wasn't always doing that, but he was very, very sharp over them. Even, even when he was getting close, he was getting a length off horses. I suppose you must have, uh, you know, it's, it's a good advert for horses learning to jump solid fences. Uh, I read that he's uh, jumped stone walls out hunting, and uh, it's put him in good stead for steeplechasing. Yes, two to five. I thought that he'd be uh, a, a worse price than that. I'm amazed that he's only two to five. But great credit to his trainer and owner, Reg Wilkins. Now, Tea Plant, a very good horse, and comes from Caroline Saunders' yard. She is really dominating the scene. But uh, Tea Plant, although he's an exceptionally good horse, does just nudge the odd fence. That is the, his Achilles heel. Yes, he unseated his rider around here when he was a uh, favourite for the race, uh, Mr. Russell. Uh, as you say, Caroline Saunders, one of the leading point-to-point -point, uh, uh, point -point trainers in the country, daughter of uh, Dick Saunders, a jockey club steward, and... Uh, former winner of the Grand National. Yes, and uh, Richard Russell is very keen to ride his own horse. 72 from threes. Don't forget the other runners are to see who's 14 years of age now, ridden by James Wintle, who's a, a, a bookmaker as well. He must be the only bookmaker riding in the blue colours. Over you, to you, Peter. And as in the previous race, 22 fences, it's the same distance this time, and it's one stung over on the far side and double silk in the centre. Double silk, big bold jump at the first from Arda C, who now goes second. Double silk and Arda C from the near side speaker's corner. And now a one stung has dropped back to the whipper in of this uh, quintet who are headed by the Grand National favourite, the Martel Grand National favourite, Double Silk, known at home as Ollie, and brought up, incidentally, on a bottle. His, uh, his dam died when he was only a week old. Double Silk coming to the third. Double Silk lands in the lead from Odyssey and T. Planter. And speaker's corner, and one stun. The fourth double silk over the water, about a three length advantage from uh, T Planter with one stung on the inside, Odyssey on the outer, and just the back mark on our speaker's corner. You wouldn't have thought that was a ditch, would you? Another plain one before the next one. Sixth. First time he hunted this horse, he jumped an iron gate. He's coming to the second of the ditches now. This ten-year-old by Dubasov out of Yellow Silk. Jumps it ahead of the winner of 15 of his 20 races, T. Planter. At the eighth, double silk, T. Planter. Beginning the run downhill now. 38 year old Ron Trelogan, a dairy farmer like the uh, owner trainer of this fine horse who jumps the ninth, about uh, three clear of Tea Planter. Over on the far side, Arda C on the near side, the right is one stump. Number 10. Silk. Jumping for fun. In the lead. Not quite 
had a clear advantage over T Planter with one stung third. As he comes down to the fence, that'll be the second last on the next circuit in this Christie's Fox Hunter chase. Number 11 this time, double silk from T Planter and one stung and Artisi and Speaker's Corner. Over the 12th, double silk. With T Planter joined by one stung. And only about a uh, length and a half up now, the favourite. As he makes his way out into the country. Double silk from T Planter and one stung. And the other's about uh, 10, at least 10 lengths adrift, the other two now. Number 13. Oh, and a mistake there by one stung. Got away with it. I'm into the water. 14. Double silk from tea planter. One stung. Long gap to Odyssey and tea planter. Third of the ditches. Double silk. Tea planter makes a mistake at it. One stung third. Another plain one before the final ditch. This is number 16, double silk, clear of tea planter, one stung, speaker's corner, and Ardesi. And now the double silk coming to the final ditch. Six from home. Oh, a beautiful jump. Tea planter jumped in second. One stung, third, four speaker's corner, and five Ardesi. Five from home, double silk, T planter. Running downhill now. Four left to jump in the Christie's Fox Hunters. And double silk, the Martel Grand National favorite. Clear, jumps it 10 to 12 lengths clear of T planter. When you think that uh, T. Plant is a winner of 15 of his 20 races, this is clearly some useful horse, this double silk. Three from home now. Ron Trelogger and double silk jumps it. A long, long way clear of T. Planter. Makes his way towards the home turn with Ron looking over his uh, right shoulder on this fine 10 year old, owned and trained by a 67 year old. Dairy farmer, Reg Wilkins, and businessman and farmer, coming down to the second last in the Christie's Fox Hunters. Double silk. The first mistake he's made. He just met that uh, fence incorrectly, but he got his way out of it, uh, just as you remember Arkell did when he ran into that very fence so many years ago. Double silk, tarring on the run-in. Well, I wouldn't say tarring, but I mean needing to be shaken up because uh, uh, he hasn't been doing a lot by his standards, uh, but he's got it in very safe keeping. And, uh, well, they say Ron doesn't look very tidy, but uh, he's certainly very, very effective. And he's proved it very often in point to points, over 100 times. So the results of the Christie's Fox Hunters Championship is first, number two, Double Silk, owned by Mr. Ridge Wilkins, trained by him and ridden by Mr. Ron Trelogan. Second was number five, T Planter, owned by Mr. R.G. Russell, trained by Miss Caroline Sanders and ridden by Mr. Richard Russell. And third is number three, Once Stung, owned by Mr. J.E. Greenall, trained by Peter Cheeseborough, and written by Mr. Johnny Greenall with fourth number four, Speaker's Corner. Well, as a result of our two big races today, Ladbrokes go seven to one with the run, the fellow for the national. Now double silk, 10 to one out from eight. They were not impressed, Mike Dillon, with this performance, but he'd been in front a long time. And now he starts to idle a bit. He made a mistake at the second last and uh, up the run in, tea planters never really gonna get there.
I was just worried for a strider to, uh, when we were watching the race, we thought this was just going to be a procession, but as you say, he just got close to the second last, and uh, he's been, as you say, in front a long time, his concentration's gone, but uh, he's going to give uh, Ron Trelogan a great ride around Liverpool, isn't he? Because, he's, as we say, he's not that extravagant, but he's very sharp and clever. Yes, and the fact that he can pick his game up again, Skew, after that mistake, and then looking to idle in front, he looked tired, and then he pulled out more. The winner's price is two to five favourite, well, any of the big punters who were betting heavy odds on uh, had very little worry, very little cause con for concern here at all. And he'll go to entry now for the Martel National with a very live chance and the envy of many jockeys. There's a lot of uh, the top pros would give their right arm to be on this fellow going round Liverpool. Double Silk winning this race for the second year in a row goes off at two to five favourite. T Plant a second at seven to two, once stung, Never looked very happy, did he? And gave Johnny Green all a few <laughs> moments of concern. Was third at seven to one. Ron Trelogan, a dairy farmer, and uh, once wanted to be a jockey, a proper jockey, but was advised to stick at the game where you probably make a few quid. <laughs> make more money farming than he ever will uh, being a national hunt jockey, anyway. This horse is the first horse since College Master to uh, win this race in two years running in 1961-62. College what? Master uh, on this race, which so just shows you that uh, they're not easy to come by these races at Cheltenham, whether it's the Hunter Chase or uh, whatever race it is. The Jadami, we saw him trying to uh, win two Gold Cup in a row, yeah, not easy to win. And as with uh, Denoli yesterday, this horse has obviously been the uh, object of most of the spies, you know, and the agents trying to wrest him away from Reg Wilkins, but he has resisted. And, and, and as he says, what do you do with money? You can't eat it. You... No, the national hunt racing, yes, OK, well, everybody wants to make a living, but it's not about that, is it? it it's the glory of it and uh, the thrill of being in association with such a great racehorse and uh, that, as you say, money can't buy that. I think when they look back on this tomorrow, they'll be happy enough. The fact that he raised his game again after just looking as if he was going off the boil for a bit. But as he comes in, let's catch up with the results earlier on. The 2.15, the Triumph Hurdle, first number 29, My Silve, 2 to 1 favourite. Second number 20, Moorish, 12 to 1. Third number 30, Shirley's Delight, 10 to 1. And fourth number 4, Blue Grotto, 50 to 1. 2.50 at Cheltenham, uh, first number 2, Balassani, 92 joint favourite. Second number 1, Avro Anson, 8 to 1. And third number 7, Manila Lad, 7 to 1. The Cheltenham Gold Cup, the 3.30. First number 13, The Fellow, 7 to 1. A second number 9, Jodami, 6 to 4 favourite. And third number 15, Young Hustler, 20 to 1. The 4.5, the uh, Fox Hunter Chase. First number 2, Double Silk, 5 to 2 on, favourite. Second number 5, Tea Planter, 7 to 2 against. And third number 3, Once Stung. 7 to 1 and 5 ran. And here comes the horse who's still favourite for the Grand National with most bookmakers. And what a moment for his 67 year old owner trainer, Reg Wilkins from the Mendy Hills and Ron Fuller. A second successive Christie's Fox Hunters chase, but it's just another footstep to the greatest test of all up at Aintree in three weeks' time. And now back to results from elsewhere. We're starting with the two o'clock at Hexham. First number five, here comes Tibby, nine to two. And second number two, bit of a natter, 20 to one. Only two finished, two out of four in that race. The 235, first number two, Scarber, seven to two. Second number eight, Volunteer Point, three to one favorite. And third number one, Colonel Buckmore, or Cole Buckmore, 130. 315, first number six, Duchess of Tubber, eight to one. Second number nine, The Pod's Revenge, six to one. And third number eight, Norick, 